ओके सर 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 यस गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग वी आर नॉट सीइंग हिम या या माय वीडियो इज ऑफ बिकॉज आई एम एट द हॉस्पिटल एंड आई एम वर्किंग विद द मोबाइल ओके सर ओके राइट तो प्रेसिडेंट इज ऑल्सो देयर फॉर बैंड विद Dr. Siva, just now he joined with the. Uh, I, I left the trauma webinar and I came here. Oh, he's yes. Simultaneously, trauma is also starting. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's six p.m. Both. Uh... Okay. So, can we start? Uh, yes. Five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. We can start. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening you, to sir. all. Uh, once again i would like to welcome you all for the uh, webinar second webinar of the ioa subcommittee arthroplasty committee and uh, to start with i would like to uh, invite dr navin takkar our secretary to uh, start the program and uh, give us a welcome address thank you thank you very much uh, sorry my face you are not able to see because my bandwidth is low with the mobile but uh, we are very much thankful for uh, specialty committee for arranging such a fantastic program under the leadership of uh, dr pachore sir and rajkumar natishan and we welcome all the faculty and thanks a lot without wasting any much time i request uh, dr rajkumar to start academic activities thank you sir yeah uh, thank you dr uh, secretary uh, now i'd like to ask dr uh, uh, pachore sir to just give a few words and uh, kick start the program Uh, thank you all the faculty uh, this is a good initiation by ioa which i just discussed right now the speciality and we are this time uh, the uh, rajkumar has done a wonderful work of picking up the picking up the faculty because we wanted uh, we wanted actually the uh, the young generation of orthoplastic surgeon to they have they should have a platform they should discuss so that we uh, we are able to create actually a different environment so i am really thankful to Raj, uh, rajkumar for picking up this uh, excellent faculty and we will have a live discussion and the main idea of this is to uh, dissipate our knowledge whatever we have and discuss among ourselves and what is the best can be done for our patients so without wasting i think we should go ahead with the presentations and uh, with a regular program thank you sir thank you for your kind words uh, for this today's evening is the theme is uh, primary uh, and complex primary knee arthroplasty and we will try to discuss and bring out some good valid take home message points on total knee arthroplasty con con connect, uh, considering the primary and complex primary the revision aspect we will keep it as the next uh, program uh, today's uh, program moderator will be our dr neerad uh, dheeraj maruti jain sir from uh, Uh, Vadodara and Dr. Ahmedabad. 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 Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Ahmedabad. Sorry. Uh, and uh, Dr. Indrajit Sardar will uh, start with the symposium. Over to Dr. Dheeraj, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thanks uh, Dr. Rajkumar, Chairman of Subcommittee, and uh, IOA President B. Shiva Shankar and Dr. Navin Bai, uh, Secretary. So I will invite symposium. on primary total knee replacement by dr indrajit sarja over to you sir yeah thank you thank you dr maruti uh, we'll just start off with the, uh, i'll just share my screen and then get on can you see Ah yes, sir. Okay, yeah. I just gone off for just a second. Just a second. Yeah. So what we will be discussing today would be really basic stuff mainly, but points which have been under consideration and conflict and. Uh, many uh, opinions on various aspects of it so let me start off this thing with the first one uh why template now why template has many reasons why yes why no but the fact is that uh, it was mainly done to do to predict the size of the mm -hmm. primary processes now i'd ask this question to the uh, all of the faculty 
as to why you template. That's number one. And number two is, uh, do you really template all your cases? Uh, anyone can take it up. Uh, 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 for example, yeah, Dr. Sharojit Patnaik. Is he on? Dr. Patnaik? Unmute himself. Sorry, I was un I, I just uh, muted myself. So templating is absolutely very, very essential uh, in a primary totally arthroplasty. Uh, for that uh, matter, any arthroplasty or any fracture surgery, because of the very fact that templating helps us to plan. And templating also helps us to say that what are the different uh, aspects of uh, uh, preoperative planning we are able to do. Uh, by using these uh, templates. Now, uh, the, the templates are available and uh, they are uh, available with each company and uh, they are available for superimposition. And uh, this always has to be compared with uh, manual X-rays uh, considering the uh, magnification factor. And uh, it's important because uh, to plan for any case which is a post surgery case like high tibial osteotomy, if we require an offset stem, uh, for example, for need of uh, um, any sort of a stem extender, and uh, this will be apparent during templating. And uh, nowadays we are having a lot of digital templates, softwares are available, but uh, there is a lot of study which suggests there is no great advantage of these digital templates compared to. Yeah, our uh, manual templating. Okay, the question was, do you template all your cases or do you do it selectively? Uh, we do it uh, selectively, but not all the cases. Straightforward cases, not much of deformity, mm. but we take, a, uh, we take a hip knee at the ankle weight bearing uh, scanogram and yeah. there we see for the, uh, the distal femur valgus uh, okay. angle what we have to take. And uh, both the uh -huh. sagittal and the coronal plane uh, uh, deformities uh -huh. are assessed. Both the coronal and the uh, sagittal plane deformities are assessed. And uh, uh -huh. the sizing, uh, it's usually like uh, if, if there is any specific indication for that, or we are in a position where we have to plan for a constraint prosthesis, or in a situation we see an abnormally unusually small femur. Uh, then only we, or in any case with a fixed flexion deformity, then only we template those cases. So uh, a question to the rest of the panel, uh, Dr. Shah, Ashit Shah. Yes. Okay. So as far as templating is concerned, uh, generally it used to be a good habit and we learned with the templates. However, you know, with the increased number of uh, cases, the companies are providing us with all the of the implant. Generally, I would agree with Dr. Samarjit that, you know, I don't primarily template all my cases for the sizing of the prosthesis, but what is more important is to get a, a scanogram so that we can draw the mechanical axis and then accordingly plan our axis, how much is going to be DFA, distal femoral valgus angle, uh, the medial tibial, uh, the, the tibial uh, angle and uh, the mechanical axis of the tibia and the femur. So rather scanogram and drawing those lines, mechanical and anatomical axes are more important <clears throat> for considering a manual uh, total knee replacement that standard uh, we do here. Do you consider a scanogram an absolute necessity in all the cases? I do for all of them. And I draw the lines and make sure that, and, and uh, there is a huge variation earlier. Earlier, I was not very, I didn't bother much about the scanograms. And we just used to keep a standard five, six degree valgus angle for the distal femoral cut. And after doing scanograms for last seven, eight years, we know that there is a huge variation of, uh, in a plain, simple varus knee, there is a big variation of valgus angle right from five degrees to seven, eight, 10 degrees at times. So if you were to remain stuck to five, six degrees of valgus, almost 20, 30% of the times, your mechanical axis will not be appropriate. So we and can... suppose we don't have a uh, uh, situation where we don't have a, a scanogram, then at least pelvis, x-ray pelvis with both hips. 
Correct. which shows us the valgus angle, the coxa, the coxofemoral right. angle. I think that's very important and the offset, the offset of the hip joint and any femoral bowing. So accordingly, we can plan our uh, uh, cuts. Distal femoral cut. Distal femoral cut. Valgus, yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically, we can conclude from this that a templating is essential and that we would do a scanogram in almost all cases, even though scanograms are not available in many places, but at least a, a standing x-ray of both the knee joints in the AP position and in the uh, lateral position. So uh, uh, fine, we'll go on to the next one. Can I, can I make, a, make a point here? If yes, the scanogram is not available because all the hospitals may not have it, uh, what you must do is take an X-ray of the knee centered with maximum of the femur and maximum of the, the, of the tibia in one plate. Or maybe take the X-ray plate oblique so that you have a longest diagonally, uh, the longest diagon of that uh, X-ray plate and the AP X-ray on that. So we'll have a maximum length of the distal femur and the proximal tibia. So as to have some idea of how much it's going. And that, along with the PBH X-ray, will tell us how much is going to be the uh, neck shaft angle of the femur at the hip joint, and accordingly to change your valgus angle. Right. Uh, and along with that, uh, the, uh, the X-rays of the, the AP lateral, I think skyline or merchant's view also is equally important, especially in valgus knees, to see the patella positioning and uh, osteophytes on the lateral compartment of the knee joint, sir. Sure. That's that's a very good point. Actually, uh, skyline sh skyline view should be made as a routine for all the cases. So it gives so much of information: how much of patella tilt, how much of patella subluxation, the lateral facet thinning, so much of osteophytes. So everything, so much of information you get it from the skyline view, and uh, it will also help how much of lateral tightness is there perioperatively, how much of latinocular tightness is there. All those things the skyline view gives. And also to quickly add upon, the stress views also is very important preoperatively. Particularly in a valgus situation, a stress view, without a stress view, uh, it is very, very uh, not at all correct to go inside and uh, uh, have some surprises. So better to have stress view so that we can see whether there is a bone loss, whether it is correctable or not correctable, partially correctable. I think that's an important point to see whether there is bone loss on one side or not. So you can be prepared with the stems and the uh, possibility of grafts or something else. Uh, as regards size, I don't think it's very important because now the companies give you all the all the sizes in a, a sterilized box so you can see whatever that you need to do. And that's the reason why these papers came out at that time. And uh, you can find out the defects on the tibial condyle by this uh, doing the templating or on the medium side or you can do a size AP or you can do a size lateral by seeing that the lateral condyle, uh, which is a smaller condyle, uh, and size it up properly. So all this helps in templating, and that's a useful thing to do before even a standard TKR. But then I suppose in the volume of cases that uh, all of you do, there'll be areas in which you may not be able to do uh, all that. But it's nice to target that, that that should be done. Okay, the next question is the drains. So, do all of you use drains? No. Yeah. All, drain less all of us. Yes. Yeah. All of us use drains. No, I don't no, use drains. No drain. No drain. No drain. No drain. Also. <laughs> okay. One important point here I would like to suggest. It is for the surgeons who are uh, young and uh, not yet baptized into arthroplasty. Unless they are very meticulous in their closure techniques, it is safer to use a drain. Otherwise, they create a lot of problems in, in the sense that uh, with the improper closure, there can be some gash shadows inside the knee joint. There have been uh, the hematoma in the knee joint. So that becomes a problem. So for the young and the uninitiated, they should learn at least uh, either they put a drain or they are very meticulous with their closure techniques and their uh, um, before they finish up the case, the hemostasis, and then only they go for uh, without drain. Let us let us ask uh, the other panelists also whether they. Uh... Actually, uh, if I may interject, uh, 
i feel if you are using a if you are using a tourniquet during the surgery and you are releasing the tourniquet after closure then you probably need to put a drain but if you are releasing the tourniquet and catching the bleeders then the call based on the surgeon's choice but what i do is i use the tourniquet throughout the procedure do the closure then release the tourniquet so i always use a drain for 24 hours and uh, i feel that is probably ideal if you are not using a tourniquet you need to catch the bleeders before you close um okay. can i just uh, add something this uh, my first 5 years or so every patient i had put the drain and next 5 years i have not placed drain at all up the new evidence which suggests that you know there's it's not going to make much difference especially with the tranexamic acid we release tourniquet before closure and other things in fact uh, about 400 cases we presented in our uh, isk meeting and in fact uh, my paper was the gold medal paper which suggested it's very clear it makes no difference between the two and also uh, there was slightly higher chance of transfusion especially in bilaterals if you keep a suction drain compared to the uh, you know the non suction drain if you are using but i think all of us are using the suction drain only so we have stopped that practice completely and i think you know that is the evidence as well in lot of literature unless complicated revisions a lot of synovectomy bleeding types and other things same here as well i i think we, uh, we don't use drains there is no evidence for that uh, in fact even for a straight forward revision we have not been using me and my colleague uh, dr santosh uh, we have done at, at least around 1000 joints we have not used drains and uh, we follow the rapid rehab protocols all that the drain does is it pulls out the blood and uh, they, we haven't transfused for a primary tkr until today almost it was uh, bilateral my bilateral study it was yeah yours was a bilateral study yeah. is it okay. okay yeah there are questions regarding we, sites do you do you guys use the use the uh, tourniquet or not we use the yes, yes. we we use tourniquets yeah but you release the tourniquet before closure or not really No, no, no. I, no, I don't manage. We just, we just use Tranex, uh, local Tranex, and uh, and that's it. And then no. uh, kind of an RJ compression for a couple of days. No, uh, I after the cement is set, I release the tourniquet in all patients for a couple of reasons. One, if there is any you know inadvertent bleeding, you can see. Second is that also in you know, a vascular injury, for example. you know if you have a tourniquet release it is very safe and it hardly takes you know extra 2 minutes to see see what is happening and if your tourniquet is release especially the lateral genital vessel etc you can if you are not really cauterized probably you will have a lot of bleeding later yeah that's so right I, yeah. yeah i would probably agree with you aran and because if you are not using a tourniquet you need to catch the bleeders especially the lateral genital it will bleed you might you will have a bigger problem with the hematoma in the knee in the post op If you are not using a drain, my suggestion would be to cauterize the bleeders before you uh, don't use the drain. But one thing is also true: the lot of bleeding happens later in the post-operative period. You know, you can't catch all of them after just releasing the tourniquet. Yes. But however, you see whether you release it before or later, the the drain has been almost you know a lot of lot of studies have come up now saying that you know not much use honestly. so that is very important to understand that when we use drain the tamponade effect that we get is lost so all that drain does is basically whatever is getting collected and because of the tamponade effect the it uh, it will stop the bleeding that does not happen so it is probably counterproductive because as the studies have shown that if you use drain then you have to have you know there is increased number of blood transfusion in even in primary knees so moment you stop using the drain be meticulous with your surgery dissection and use now the wonder drug called tranexa for last so many years i think the use of blood transfusion is minimized and the drain probably is not necessary all that at uh, you know as ravi kumar said it does is when the patient starts mobilizing and the drain is there it gets pulled off and you honestly get a call at 9 in the evening that patient is bleeding and that is actually is bleeding from the uh, drain which is pulled out partially and how many hours the, those who use the tourniquet uh, call, drain will use it pardon how oh, how, how many hours they will uh, they will remove the drain after the surgery okay so someone who using the drain yeah. yeah 
as in the anesthesia whatever anesthesia their blood pressure will be low and immediately after the release of the tonic we will not see the capillary or the ooze from the bone in the initial time so when it picks up the blood pressure after they stabilize they come out of the anesthesia by evening so they may bleed little bit so this may cause tissue edema and decreased rom or difficulty in initial rehabilitation so we customized in this way like we do um, under tonic release the tourniquet as dr narayan ulse told we uh, especially the liga uh, lateral inferior genicular artery coagulate that and also few feeding vessels of the synovium in the suprapatellar area coagulate them and uh, observe for any major vessels in the center then uh, local transient acid put a drain and close it and and don't open the drain for first 6 hours anyway that time blood pressure will be low they won't bleed and and in the evening open the drain next day remove the drain so this is i mean we are finding i mean transfusions are also not more because it will not bleed more uh, and also we are protected with whatever tissue edema it causes due to collection so we are safe in both the way we can any major intraoperative bleeders can be caught and uh, and also drain is there for 24 hours and also it is planned for 6 hours this is what we are customized after doing some small audit in the hospital yeah yeah right so we are divided on the drains those who use a tourniquet would rather use a drain but they would release the tourniquet and those who do not use drains they do it in their own way i think we are still divided on this but uh, the older group would probably use drains the younger group would probably not use drains so but whatever but whatever may be whether we use or <laughs> if we use or not better to remove the drain as early as possible yes. even if the drain is used that should be the message that's a message that's a message rajkumar you absolutely right Get Another back. thing, yeah. I request to the faculty: don't repeat the same uh, points again and again. So we will cover more the uh, questions. Yes, yes, I think that's a, that's another advice. Gap balancing versus measured dissection. Is this all theoretical, or do you really follow one at the exclusion of the other? Doctor Samir, yeah, I usually do a hybrid technique. If there is a straightforward knee, usually do a measured dissection. If it's a severe virus or valgus, usually when for a mixer technique. like some amount of virus will give in the fem- femoral side to balance if the severe virus knee like that so any basically exclusive, hybrid technique any exclusive person who use only one type sorry any person who use only gap balancing or only measured dissection or every person will use a mixture of both the yeah, be always a mixture of both right i am not a fan of following only one protocol or one measure of because it depends from patient to patient yeah i think it's a, not an either or situation you do it as you uh, and, and if you look at it the we both start off with measured dissection probably and then go on to the gap balancing yeah that's right so that argument is really a bit theoretical stress fractures in extreme deformities do you would you use cpr with intramedullary stems with unicortical plates would you use cpr with stems only or would you do the fracture fixation first then wait for it to unite and do a subsequent tkr after the fracture So it's always uh, TKR with uh, intramedullary stents only. It all depends upon where is the stress fracture, whether it is within the limits of these stems. If then definitely, if it's a very proximal, close to the joint, you can use a stem. If it's far away, either use a short stem and fix it with plates or screws. That's Basically, the stress fracture is because of the deformity. So as long as we are not addressing to the deformity, this stress fracture also, even if you try to fix it, there is a high chance of it going going to non-union or delayed union. anybody else so typically fracture would need an intramedullary stem now by definition stress fracture would be generally stable fracture it will not be displaced it will be like a unicortical fracture so it may not need most of the times a unicortical plate or anything so if you have a actually a traumatic fracture in an osteoarthritic or maybe a patient who comes with a tibial fracture but he has got a severe osteoarthritis of knee 
there that's a different issue that's a traumatic fracture there depending on the merits of the fracture you have to fix the fracture which may be a separate plate or you can do it with a total knee with a additional fixation of the plate so that's a different traumatic fracture in an osteoarthritic knee the stress fracture per se would be a stable where probably if we can bypass that uh, stress fracture lesion at least couple of lengths uh if you see the breadth of the tibia and multiply by 2 if you are able to go that much distally beyond the stress fracture and get the stability you may uh, do well just an intramural stem with the tibia yeah. uh, indrajit yes. one small suggestion if you are have a stress fracture quite below do a fibulectomy also because these fractures otherwise they go into non union non union this is quite a mistake done by most of our orthoplasty surgeons so be careful on this fracture and the healing rate once you correct the deformity healing rate is extremely good and you may not need a plate additional plate very rarely you need additional plate you should have a good fixation yes i think sir, sir my question to you sir uh, the site of the fibulectomy uh, yeah it is uh, around 6 to 7 mm centimeter below the neck of the neck of the fibula because you don't go higher because otherwise you have popliteal and usually a fhl injury so that is the reason you should not go higher up i presented the same case in roc a couple of yeah. years back yeah 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 uh, i think the fibula is a very important point but sometimes you know that there is a stress fracture in the tibia and there is a stress fracture in the fibula <clears throat> it's the same patient both sides yeah so how would you tackle which one how? only stem uh, dr pachore's uh, fibula has been done by the patient <laughs> so, um... so if you see on the right side uh, i mean just in ap we cannot see exactly where but i understand right at the lower part of the x ray there would be a fracture if you see in the lateral it is going slightly towards hypertrophic non union sort of uh, appearance um i think so you know it is quite away from uh, where ideally we would be able to you know hold it with a stem but once we do a primary total knee stem definitely would be necessary here because patient would have some tibial medial defect which will have to be reconstructed either with bone graft screws or an augment uh i have a feeling that this may require a plate uh, along with on the right side i'm talking about uh, a plate uh, to have the additional stability restored yeah. if you don't get uh, uh, uncemented fixation 2.5 cortical diameter below the fracture it is always better to supplement with fixation if you get that i mean no need of stem alone will help yeah quickly quickly so okay. this is what was done on one side and uh, you can see that this uh, screw is a little bit too big but uh, it, uh, we had to go on this way that way and and the seventh but we got the stem the reason was we used a stem is look at the intermedullary canal it was a very tight fit the fibula is fractured so we were able to get this thing on a pre pretty uh, positioning the other side we did this but here i will show you another thing which we did on the way yeah that we used a temporary plate we used a temporary unicortical plate because the fibula was fractured so it's moving this way and that way we used a, a, a temporary plate and then put in the stem and then remove the plate there is one more way when we can use a lamina spreader to stabilize that fracture and uh, that makes also without putting a plate we can stabilize the fracture by distracting the lamina spreader and then take all our cuts and then we do the intramedullary fixation again that depends on the level of the stress fracture if yes. you have already put the plate and we could have left it now why did you remove the plate sir sorry sir huh. because of the skin condition the skin was sorry, not good, yeah, so yeah, yeah. if the plate was there that would interfere with it so we removed the plate and it was quite stable previous implant removal same time as a total knee replacement or you want to do it at a earlier state or later state it depends so, on the implant and uh... yes now there are okay. some implants which will be difficult to remove which will you yes. know increase the uh, more operative time etc but there are some which you have to remove if you want to put in some so would you want to do it at the same time as uh, as when you are doing the tkr 
or you want to remove it, wait for some time and then uh, uh, and then go on for the uh, PKR. If you feel that that implant which is there is going to come in the way of your tibial resection or femoral resection and putting your standard primary knee, those are the only implants you remove. If you can buy your standard primary uh, dissection, I mean the cut of the soft tissues and exposing the bone, if the implant is visible, maybe extend it by a couple of inches, you can reach to that implant and remove that much portion of the implant, then better to avoid another incision. Important to know what a... implants are there because sometimes this plating or screw or plate screws have been done many years ago or some else not in your center you may have to have those particular screwdrivers to remove the screw that's the difficulty that i you know always face practically that some something done 20 30 years ago 40 years ago they have machine screws and those screwdrivers may not be available in our standard sets so those kind of uh, problems you have to anticipate when you see this implant especially when whenever the implant is an intramedullary implant in the femoral side that's an important implant which necessarily has to be removed because uh, usually we use a intramedullary uh, device for getting all our femoral cuts and alignments. So that is a kind of uh, position where probably we have to remove the implant. We can do that in the same sitting or another sitting. That's not a problem, but implant removal there is more important. If the, if the femoral with navigation, with navigation you can, you know, uh, avoid um, yeah, it's that point Suppose where you don't, don't, have, don't need yes. to put an intramedullary Yes, um, you know, rod, the patient and then you can go ahead and remove only patient. those implants which are actually, uh, you know, causing problems or in, on the way of seating the implant. Yes. And the okay. most important thing is infection should be ruled out in any kind of implant, previous implant, because if there is infection, you need to do a two stitch. So that is also That's a very good. important point. It is most important. If the implant is coming in the way of your surgery or where your implant is seated, only I touch the implant. Otherwise, I don't remove any implants if it's not going to hamper your surgery. Yeah, in this Regarding this infection, we should have a high index of suspicion because most of the time when the Indian implants are used, either because of a local metallosis or uh, maybe a low-grade uh, sub sub subclinical infection. Now, these things have to be very careful. We have to be very careful about the tissues which we are handling near the previous implant. I think infection is very important, which decides whether we do a single stage or a two-stage uh, implant removal and adjunct. Especially uh, recently operated cases, there is a high chance of infections. Yeah. Yes. If you do it at the same setting. Uh, yes. The other side was being operated. So at that time, we removed the screws. And then uh, four or five days later, was it a week later, we went in and did the uh, knee replacement. And we, when we removed the screws, we took a culture from the screw uh, holes. And that all came out negative. So we were on safe grounds there. You should keep a, uh, one important lesson from all our orthoplasty surgeons is inventory of implant removal. We take it very lightly, very yes. lightly. Yeah. So we need to actually know what is the implant. It should have a cutting instrument also. If there's a long plate, distal plate on the femur, you just cut the distal portion and get out instead of opening the whole of the femur. So I think that is another important thing which we should have in our inventory. Right. It's a very good point because if you uh, remove whole plate, then it increases the stress size and create uh, post-operative or periprosthetic fracture so many times. Yes, there are weak spots there. Bone defect, uh, we uh, generally use a bone graft screw fixation stems and sometimes with the less than 5 millimeter cement screw support and all that. And we know all this. So this was the uh, graft which was put over here. And this was the whole extent of the uh, defect over there and this. The only thing I'd like to point out here, would you use this uh, preliminary uh, mm. making the holes, uh, making the uh, position for the, uh, for the implants mm. before or after the graft positioning? And in this, I would just add one point is that the standard ones that we use is a depoy one with the straight wings. But if you use an attune where it is going backwards, then it's a problem with these where to put in the screws. I think, sir, uh, all those cases where the keel is going into the defect, you must uh, take implants which have a stem extender. Yes. That is the most important point. 
Absolutely. You might prepare the graft bed later on and fix the implant, uh, the bone graft later, but you need to be careful that the keel has, if the keel has been prepared and it is going into the defect, it needs to be supplemented with a stem. That is the most important point. I think. You can use the short cemented stems for that. Yes. Yeah. Retain the patella. Patella plasty better than patella resurfacing. This uh, debate has gone on for ages now, years. <laughs> So, who, so who, who, who picks the patella, uh, who resurfaces it, and who retains it? Yes. Dan? So, I, I have been uh, Dr. Anavat's fellow, so we have I been was, taught to replace the patella. So, I have been. I was, up, I was about to tell that all ROC fellows in India will resurface, and non ROC fellows will not resurface. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 that is not true. That is not true. Thanks, Kalji. So even I, Indian I, I, I think arthroplasty I, I, has a lot of influence from Guru Reddy and Ashok Raj Gopal. So many people will not, uh, you know, resurface the patella. I think yeah. so. The way is uh, to first of all, it's important to know how is the tracking, rather than whether it's grade two, grade three uh, um, arthritis <clears> in the <throat> patella femoral joint. That's probably not so important. It is important to track the patella properly into the trochlear notch of the implant. So that is the first and foremost thing. Once you have done your basic cuts of femur, tibia, and you got the rotation right, and if your patella tracking is fine, then perhaps you can, depending on the thickness of the patella, because many of our patients are short. They are hardly 4'8", 4'9", 4'11", height uh, women. They have a short, small patella. And then you start resecting, and we may encroach into the minimum depth of the patella to be retained. So in those cases, once you have the proper tracking, you can just do a patelloplasty and leave those patients. However, when you have a thick patella and then you may select to resurface the patella, that is entirely surgeon's choice. But either ways, if your tracking is good, then either with the PS knee or with the cruciate retaining knee, the patella will be okay. I know all PS surgeons, even I am a PS surgeon, we all have been taught to replace the patella when you are doing a PS knee with a particular PFC Sigma, which has got a large box. But the newer designs of the same company and the other implants, they have a smaller box. So you can probably get away without replacing a patella, even if you are doing a PS knee. A couple of uh, points. Uh, I have not been a uh, Renault fellow, but uh, I replace all patellas. That's one thing. And uh, second thing is, it's been shown in multiple studies you will not be able to select which patella to resurface, which not by looking at the cartilage. Sure. Whether you are a selective uh, resurfacer or non-selective resurfacer, whatever, you will not be able to decide just looking at the cartilage. So it is not possible. Third thing is about this uh, tracking of patella. Now, whether you resurface or not, we always have to make it really track well. So again, it really doesn't matter whether you resurface or not. But one thing we can do, if the patella is not tracking well, if you use a smaller size of button for the patella, for example, you can bring it little medial, little superior, for example, in case if you have a patella baha, etc. So by resurfacing patella, you can actually improve the patella tracking if you want to do. Now we have a lot of small patellas, etc. But I never had such problem, you know, in terms of resurfacing patella, even though we have a smaller size, etc. But uh, I think, you know, all of us are patella resurfacing. None of us have these, uh, you know, the buttons which goes into the patella. I don't think anybody else, anybody is doing in the country at the moment, but... Uh, inlay, you mean inlay buttons? Yeah, inlay buttons. So we all use the out, you know, the onlay, yeah. onlay button. Yeah. yeah. So I don't I, think so. I, Any of the system that are available, I, which I, allows... I'm right. not an ROC fellow, but I replace all my patellas. Same as you. There are medical and non-medical reasons also. Non-medical being, see, when I tell a patient the total knee replacement, I have had a couple initially when I didn't replace, they had some sort of vague pains here and there and some of our own fellows tell because you have not replaced the patella, you are getting it, so they should have done it. So that also is one of the reasons which I consider in addition to all the medical reasons we can discuss pros and cons here. But I feel, and, and in, in the US when I went and I was with David Fisher for some time, he said one of the reasons he replaces is none of this because he gets extra money for replacing patella. If he doesn't, he doesn't get that extra money. But we don't get. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so there are a lot of reasons to replace or not, but uh, for whatever reasons, I am replacing all of them. Yeah. So those, no, I, 
I think so. Uh, in uh, 2019, ish in Bangalore, I think so. There was a statement that we took. If Dr. Pachore remembers that all these controversies were voted by each and every member, uh, sir, Dr. Pachore, yeah, yeah. would you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think so. This was one of the question in that, and uh, so legal part is taken care of in that. For as I understand. So that's no, not a, a big issue for us. It is is it? No, it is actually not the legal part in the court as such. It is just the difficulty in explaining these patients, you know, who come back with little pain. If you have already done a patella, you can tell them, you know, it's just a muscular pain or myalgia. Otherwise, the, your competitor will tell you it's because you have not reserved a patella. Actually, what if that myalgia uh, doesn't go, practice, you know, that anterior knee practice, pain is totally the medical different. medical terminology, this becomes a bigger headache. Yeah. Explaining to the patient, even the courts also, it's difficult to explain to them the medical terminology, sir. So. the person who is a judge may not necessarily be a very educated and uh, uh, soft person yeah. for you so i think lot of factors in addition to the medical reasons why i replaced but i think the two things uh, i don't know i'll ask uh, dr pachore as well couple of things are very important here one is uh, if you are resurfacing patella as we all do there is definitely higher chance of patella fracture obviously you have one extra added procedure with extra complications which is true whereas in almost all large studies if the patella is not resurfaced they do have a higher anterior pain you know whatever the definition of that anterior pain may be it is difficult sometime to define that but lot of studies have shown that what do you think sir yeah uh, let me come to that now if you look at the, this is this controversy is not going to end because we are we even though there are a lot of prospective random going on the one thing is very important now because old time we didn't had a femur which was friendly with the cochlea yeah today the designs have changed where designs have changed it has made lot of difference lot of difference and secondly the clunk syndrome whether you re- replace patella or not replace patella there is a minor difference minor difference so why many people like to do the patella replacement uh, according to ranawat whatever now ranawat fellows we are already discussed that there is a if you consider 98% of the 98% is the uh, what you call as satisfaction rate of a patella patient who is replaced and those patients who are not replaced it is 25 or 2 or 3% difference that is the that is the quoting dr ranawat had so if you uh, if you look at our own data of age of 2 lakh joints 2 lakh joint let me come to that the people who are using the uh, pfc the 78 to 80% are replacing patella and if you look at the femur there only for, only 25 to 28% people are using uh, patella replacement so that is the that is the difference which we have and in general of 2 lakh and 50000 uh, joints 50% of the surgeons are using 50% are not using so that is the data we have today so one sir, thing your question is that is it really uh, related to implant then what it, do you think? it was a training and it was initially related to the implant there was no question about it no but last decade that implant design has quite changed and now there is no issue in patella uh, yeah that, yes that is the reason if you look at the 5 years back data pfc had 95% surgeons were replacing but they have now reduced to 78% no i have i have published this cost cost of the patella uh, no 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 i don't think no 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 the cost of the patella complications I think, I think it it is the uh, the anterior knee pain has reduced because of patella replacement, especially with the implants like the Etude. So I published a paper with Dr. Nawaz and Dr. Amar on this. There is the studies on Etude, which says that anterior knee pain and clunk is less than with those uh, with the Etude knees. Those studies are called originator studies, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and also, but in Etude, if you see, uh, we have had a couple of cases. where there is a there was a patella fracture and as narain told once there is a patella fracture it is very difficult and one of the case it went into non union we did everything uh, but it wouldn't heal so you can imagine so if you see there is no strong evidence to state that you replace and the outcome is good so i think uh, if it, if your design is patella friendly uh, then i don't think we should go and and uh, do the patella resurfacing 
because most of our patients are elderly and uh, they are osteoporotic so i think we should think twice uh, before research yeah, i think i and, think uh, one of the I... other causes what we note for the anterior knee pain is the medial saphenous nerve neuroma so it's a very uh, i mean uh, you, you, you see a lot of those so yeah. Yeah. finally uh, i think the time is running out so i'll finish off with this case and this is a 60 year old female bilateral stiff painful knee gradually increasing for the last 5 years the rom of only 20 to 40 degree walking distance 5 to 10 meters spine pain stiffness and tenderness diffuse pain in tibia and femur and there is no neurovascular deficit this was the x ray <coughs> Would you uh, point out anything in it which you find different, patchy, or, or special? Is it Paget's or yes. osteoporosis? Yeah. No, metabolic bone disease. Yeah. Yeah, yes. metabolic bone disease. Uh, all her other uh, endocrinological investigations were normal, and as we normally do, we did. Uh, this was what the tibia looked like, and. If we don't have a diagnosis, look at the spine. Any comments? Fluorosis. 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 Yeah, this is a uh, actually an osteopetrosis, osteopetrosis, which came out to this uh, level. Now, osteopetrosis. Now, if you go back to the original femur, you can see the diminished medullary canal. So, an intramedullary rod was out. so we had to think about something else something of a patient friendly thing and uh, we used this which is i think you all familiar with this this is arthro 3d where they do a city based block calculations and then do this uh, for the different companies they have different uh, all of these implants you don't use a intra intra or extra medullary rod and uh, we had to be very careful with the drilling part of it we couldn't use the standard ones but uh, femur didn't require a drilling because we had this and uh, on the tibia side we did the drilling with increasing size of drills and then the slots that were made for the keel were drilled with the uh, saws first to uh, you know to get the uh, defects and then down the company the central plates so this was what it looked like sorry oh no so this was what it looked like uh, uh, any uh, after this was done this seemed to be another x ray i think anyway yeah. this looks uh, like a different patient no, no, go back there is one more x ray there i think yeah. but go back. these patients uh, this osteopetrosis case was very new for us because when i investigated i found there are only 50 odd cases in the entire world repeated So now this patient is about six months follow up. She is fine. She is walking. She is climbing stairs. She is doing everything. She complains of diffuse pain of the spine, but I just thought I'd present it to you to show it to you of this nature. I think we are exactly at six forty-five. Can I? Uh, shall I stop right now? Because Even Doctor Sardar has not changed the patella, so that <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, you are lucky that you went. Uh, that osteopetrosis is a very very difficult condition actually. Yes, yes. Uh, you are very lucky that you were able to at least drill it. I think yeah. you have to keep in mind you have to use a carbide drills for these patients. Correct. Carbide drills. They are uh, they they work beautifully because we did some fracture work initially maybe twenty years back when my boss was alive. So that time we used to get a carbide drill from the Lohar Chal actually. <laughs> so yeah. I think uh, uh, slot uh, the osteopetrosis and fluorosis the the slight difference is there. In fluorosis you will see some bone available. Number two, the calcification is there in the spine in fluorosis. Well, will we will not get a calcification in osteopetrosis. There are certain difference. And if and you take pelvis X-ray, you will have ligamentous calcification in fluorosis, and which will be absent in osteopetrosis. That is the difference. Difference we have. And also, sir, in osteopetrosis, this cortico medullary differentiation is not there. It becomes yes. like a single mass. Yeah, the bone yes. is not seen at all. And also, the X-ray, what has been shown as a post-op, I think it just mixed up, sir. No, what no, you are no. showing now is the correct X-ray. Now it is yeah. put the right X-ray now. Yeah. This is the one. This is the one. This is the one. Yeah. Now this is definitely osteopetrosis. Yeah. 
and he is very lucky very rare to yeah, i not seen that any and uh, in this x ray if you see on the tibial side you have not put the extension rod which is difficult to put because of the oh, drilling issues <laughs> yes yeah. you can so one, one last question pajari yeah. sir one question yeah. sir yes, from yeah. my side yeah. so you resurface yeah. the patella and they come back with the anterior knee pain hmm see anterior knee pain is a big a big thing we really really don't know uh, there are about i think almost 6 to 8% and maybe more patients have anterior knee pain and it's very very sometimes difficult suppose those patient who are not replaced by my colleague and i say that your colleague has not replaced and i will do it and if you do it 50% patients are again to continue to anterior knee pain so really we don't know it is a big problem for anterior knee pain i think the main main topic of discussion then was that if you do get uh, do not replace the patella and then the patient comes with that any pain uh, there's 12% of patients who if you replace it don't get the same results as dr pachode was saying as you have done had you done it originally so that was a paper and that's what brought about this discussion uh, throughout so uh, rajkumar shall i yes. uh, dr maloti yes. shall i sign off yeah. now i think yeah. we can go ahead with the second oh, session yes, yes. Oh. thank you thank oh. you thank you so much thank you to the panel thank you everybody i think we've had a lively discussion and i enjoyed thank, thank you thank you dr mishra ji thank you thank you sir it's thank you everyone very nice presentation and uh, we have discussed all the points uh, starting from virus and defects and uh, osteopetrosis and all the things now we can move for the second session uh in between any, any discussion or uh, we'll go ahead with yeah. the second session we can discuss in during the cases so i will invite directly first uh, speaker dr anand srivastava srinivasan dr srinivasan uh, good evening sir he is, he is speaking on osteo no he is presenting a case he is presenting a case okay okay sorry sorry he is presenting the case sorry <laughs> please share your screen uh, screen please share so time uh, remain uh, it's a 5 to 6 minutes presentation and 2 uh, to 3 minutes discussion total time is 8 minutes for each presenter uh, good evening to all uh, thank you for the opportunity to present my case uh, and very young uh, so my name is dr pranish nia i am from chennai so we are going to the case uh, so 62 year old male So he presented with pain and deformity over uh, both knees for the past fifteen years. So gradually increasing in intensity, and the uh, pain was uh, more for the past five years. Uh, he was a known case of uh, CMN, which is a known leukemic patient for which he took treatment ten years back. So uh, uh, during that time, he was uh, he had restricted mobility, for in which his uh, deformity started increasing. And he's also a known case of diabetes, uh, hypothyroidism, and uh, hypertension for which he was taking treatment. So it's a irregular treatment and uh, pain. He was having more pain over the right knee uh, than the left knee. So on uh, taking the X-ray, so on seeing the X-ray, the deformity was more on the left knee than the right knee, but his pain was more on the right knee. It was more symptomatic for him. So the standing AP view and uh, it's a lateral view. So just to be uh, sure, we also evaluated his uh, hip joint and uh, spines to check whether there were any deformities over in that region also. And then on uh, examination, uh, patient had a fixed flexion deformity of 30 degrees in both knees, and uh, the further range of motion was only from 30 degrees. He was able to only flex up more of uh, 30 more degrees, so the 30 to 60. And he didn't have any neurological deficit with the cord and his. Uh, Gait was crouching type of gait, so you have to walk. He was walking like this, so his uh, feet was not touching the ground. His heel was not touching the ground, mm-hmm. and this was his walking posture, but like crouching gait. Oh, who will take this case? Uh, panel, no. The Prasi is there. Yes, I am there. Okay. Uh-huh. So, uh, just is he? Uh, Anand, go back to the X-ray. Show the X-ray. Ah, yes. Please. And just one thing: is he rheumatoid at all? 
ஆல் <laughs> on your shelf because this is something that may you may find a uh, flexion uh, extension mismatch uh, you know in this with flexion gap being looser as compared to extension gap so that's something that you have to keep in mind extreme osteoporosis so you keep stems ready not necessarily that you may have to use them now when you are doing one knee right knee obviously uh, under anesthesia probably this will stretch out little bit so you know whatever your pre op deformity of 30 degree may actually be about 15 to 20 degrees because of pain and spasm in the anesthesia it probably will relieve some of that right then uh, standard approach uh, as you do either uh, medial parapetalar or subvastus or uh, midvastus expose the femur and when you take the distal femoral cut normally just take as much as necessary as the thickness of the femoral implant this will do the proximal tibial cut mark those distal holes in the femur and then do an ap cut of the femur now don't do the chamfers don't do the box but start working on the posterior aspect of the femur there are osteophytes posterior uh, ledge of the femoral condyle and the soft tissue release slowly with a osteotome or slowly with a curved osteotome and strip the posterior soft tissues then start slowly it will open up the extension space so this is where you put the spacer block in flexion and then gradually try to get that into extension very very you know very judiciously you may use choose to resect extra millimeter of femur but again i told you you know first is minimal resection and then do the soft tissue release which is at the back of the femur flexion deformity you have to handle it with uh, you know clearance of the posterior aspect of the femur and try and match the balance so once you have your flexion and extension balance then you can do your notch uh, uh, the complete rest of the surgery so in this post operatively post operatively patient may remain in about 5 degrees of flexion deformity if it is an osteoarthritic in a male don't accept that you have to get the knee straight patient have to be in the brace they all this patient who have long standing flexion deformity will tend to put a pillow at the popliteal fossa which is again a big no no so try to make sure that you when you take around or your residents take around the knee is straight or put a pillow at the heel level so that with the weight of the knee knee will go in extension the splint has to be on except for when they are doing at the edge of the bed and range of movement exercises they must walk with the splint they must have the night splint splint to be removed only when they are doing range of movement. dr sinivasan what you did sir as uh, sir said first before uh, going to the patient we counsel them uh, what Uh, what did the realistic expectation that's, that's okay that's okay uh, what you did uh... yes sir we almost did similar process standard anterior approach and uh, uh, with for medial parapetalar and i was not even able to uh, dislocate the patella or slide the patella because it was very chunky yes. very bulky so first i had to the rostrum slightly cut with the patella and then debulk the patella first before going in and then only i was able to proceed with as sir told uh, remove the osteophytes it first in the anteriorly and uh, anterior margins then went for the distal femur cut uh, slowly releasing all the soft tissues as and when required and uh, removing the osteophytes posteriorly um we a posterior capsule release also we did then uh, uh, as a standard 9 mm cut was uh, first taken but on uh, checking out after the tibial cut it was not i was not able to achieve the full extension so again went back i Any marked the pins i didn't remove the pins the pin was there so again went back and took uh, another uh, two mm cuts and then went in and again release all the posterior capsule and again uh, release the posterior uh, capsule from the tibial side also a little bit so that i was able to achieve uh, some good degree of extension i had a doubt 
uh, whether able to do it in the both things at the same stage or in the staged manner. Whether to do it at the same time or with staged manner, sir. So what we did was for uh, staged manner. So suppose stop me for right side. And uh, two weeks later, yes, sir. Any comment on this uh, uh, lateral X-ray? I'll I'll come. To, it's a notching. It's the femoral notching. Yeah. I'll accept that. Okay. Thank you. Nicely. Uh, so we can proceed for the. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Ravi. Yeah. The point to add is here. Uh, the we have to divide the flex flexion deformity two categories. One flex flexion deformity with good range. Okay. So then their life will be a little easy. One fixed flexibility with limited range. They can they go into stiffening. They have both the uh, um, approaches and uh, ornamentarium needed for approaching a stiffening and also a flex flexion deformity. In such cases, uh, uh, we need to have a, a semi constraint as a backup uh, uh, with stiffening. FFD with stiffening. It's must. Just a, one one small points I wanted to add. I've done that in a couple of okay. cases. Please go ahead. There's something called as a one third one third one third rule. Now there are some, you know, the TKRs, they have, you know, the knees have flexion deformity so bad, something like a 90 degrees. It's almost so difficult, even if you make the distal femur completely bare, you cannot correct them on the table. It's very difficult. And you have to use the hinge, etc. So this one of the study, which they have done, which I, I have used in a couple of rheumatoids with a severe deformity is, you do a serial plaster of this patient preoperatively. And you get about one third corrected before surgery. And on table, don't try to correct it fully. You know, you leave some degrees and then put the serial plaster later on as well, post operatively as well. And we always worry the whether we get the movement, etc. They all get reasonable movement and they all have been shown to be reasonably good with, even with the plaster correction. And uh, I was surprised before I was trying this, but it looks, uh, you know, works very well. But that that is good for an inflammatory condition. Yeah, uh, but yeah. but in this in this situation, it is like a, if it is a primary OAE, the challenge is to get the things done on table. Correct. So here here the whole point here is it's well done. The thing is you should not try to downsize the femur so much because your flexion gap balancing will become uh, difficult. So probably we don't know better operatively. Uh, but here looking at the notching here. Probably he could have gone a one size bigger and got away with the flexion tightness and try to release as much as possible. The more distal cut you take, then becomes the flexion instability. So the, the whole school of thought is always take more distal femur cut whenever there is a gross flexion deformity. But nowadays with the modern implants, we did not do that. We get all the corrections by soft tissue release and try to keep the bone cuts as minimal as possible. In fact, you can even go for go by taking a zero degree slope jig also in these kind of situations where you won't have so much of flexion problem. So try to go by that, go do good release, don't try to downsize so much, and then get the correction on table. And as correctly said, if it is a male patient obese, uh, on table, zero degrees should be achieved. Otherwise, again it will go into flexion deformity. Kaskumar, I'll add only one point. Yeah. yeah. In, in, flex, in flexion deformity, I mean, flex flexion deformity, extension is tight and flexion will be loose conventionally if they have a good range. Yes, yes. Oh. Yeah, okay. So that uh, we have to decrease the slope and uh, uh, the, the, whatever, I mean, downsize. And in flexion deformity with stiff knee, both will be tight. That's why probably he is downsized to increase the flexion, flexion gap. If, if you ask him, please ask him. I think yes, that's sir. why it is notched here. Yes, sir. I, I was I had to cut again for two months then to increase it was tight in both flexion and extension, sir. Your flexion gap was also tight, no, doctor? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was very tight. It was very plastered in like was fully plastered in, sir. So very That's tight. why you, you have to you have to differentiate between the stiff knee uh, uh, with FFD and without FFD because I had a the was series we have done here in our hospital. So that's what I check. If there is whatever FFD is there, let it be there. We can go for constantly and correct it. If mm -hmm. FFD with stiff knee, you will have challenges like this. Surprising challenges. We should uh, stick in the time. So I yeah. will request, please stop the presentation and uh, I will request our next presenter, Dr. Ravi.
Kelkar from Bangalore. Thank you. So nice. Good present. Thank Anand, you. you have to log off. It's telling I can't share the screen when you're on. You have to stop the screen share. Remove the screen, yeah. Thank you. You're able to see? Not yet. Not yet. Can I add something, Dr. Rashmi? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I have given a new classification of stiff knees, which is published online and it's coming in the August issue of Indian Orthopedic Association, IGO, okay. Indian Journal of Orthopedics. So I have classified based upon my experience into three times, uh, stiff knees in flexion, stiff in extension and those in uh, those ankylosed knees in flexion and extension. Okay. So there's a different uh, criteria and different way to approach all of these, which I think our viewers should uh, read those that paper in depth details of those are given in that. Very good, very good. Nice, Mirana. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're able to see? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please yeah. go ahead. Please go ahead. So, um, hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Ravi Kelkar from Bangalore. So, today uh, I'll be presenting. Uh... Dr. Ravi, can you please go to the uh, slide mode, uh, slideshow mode? Full, full screen. Full screen. Click on yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So we are uh, going to be talking about complex primary knee here. So I have a case uh, who's a 64 year old male. So he has knee pain since uh, many years, but last two years pain has increased and he has difficulty in walking short distances. The knee range of movement is uh, 10 to 80 and painful. Um, the only comorbid is he has hypertension and he's on Telma 40. Otherwise, he is uh, uh, pretty okay, no major comorbids. So, this is how he is uh, in terms of the uh, deformity and the problem that he has. So, obviously, you can see there is a significant virus with arthritis, and then that is the x ray, that is the uh, AP view of the right, and then that's the AP view of the left. And uh, that is the uh, lateral view. So I would uh, open up the discussion and then you guys can comment and then we'll take it from there. Yes, Mithunal. The so, the left know. side, you can concentrate on the left side. Okay, so we see here it's a virus with a bone defect and it's a long-standing virus and it's a correctable virus. So the most important thing is we need to take care of three things. One is that you don't need to cut a lot of tibia because it's already correcting on the stress views. And also we have to build up the defect. That defect is almost of the medial tibial condyle, almost, almost more than 40-50%. So I have published a paper in Indian Journal of Orthopedics in 2013 where I have published 54 cases of such kinds where we have built up the defect using bone grafts and augmented with the you know stems. If the defect is more than 50% of the medial tibial condyle and it's uh, uh, almost going up more than 10 millimeters uh, in depth, then you might need to use a mesh and uh, impaction grafting in such situations, or you can build up those defects using large metal augments. And sometimes you might need to use, uh, you know, if it's going beyond 15 centimeters, you might need to use a sleeve or a constrained implant in such situations. But in this case, probably I'll be able to manage the defect with bone graft from the chamfers. Uh, use a stem extender and uh, with the minimal obviously tibial cut. So that's my take on this. So you will take uh, both the case simultaneously or one by one? I have done both together in a lot of cases. So I'll do both together. Okay. And uh, you know, uh, same plan for the right side as well? Yes. Dr. Samir, your approach? Yeah. Basically, the left side is a little more straightforward. Only thing what I need to be taking care of the medial defect for which. I usually prefer to the, definitely there is a stem is needed and depending upon the quality of the bone, I might prefer a bone graft or even a bed will be as a backup. But definitely on the right side, I have a backup of constraint, definitely will be a semi-constraint lioness at least should be there in my backup. Just, that, yeah, quickly to add, if you're going to use a bone graft, can you explain exactly what bone graft and what you will be doing it with the bone graft? Uh, yeah, especially we take from the box. If you are using a navigation, we'll get a good box without any holes. Especially we are referring to the PS knee, so we'll get a good box knee. And preferably we'll make the 
vertical cut is little more uh, laterally so that we'll get a step cut. So the graph will become more stable and temporarily fixed with the K wire. And then the keel will be prepared on the keel, keel in situ, fix it with screws. And definitely will be augmented with the stumps. I think you use the technique. Uh, I use the technique by Windsor et al. And also given by Dr. Anavat and others, where they have uh, actually uh, used the, uh, the distal femur and the proximal tibial bone cuts, uh, the bone from there. And uh, once you prepare the keel, you prepare the bone bed, you use that graft. Uh, in Sancheti, they use a step cut technique, but I usually uh, raw the graft in an oblique fashion, put in the graft, stabilize with wires, then put in the screws, and then see to it that the keel uh, preparation is also good, and then augment it with stems. Um, if the patient is affording, you can use augments, obviously. Show us the, what you did in post op Yeah, so I think the reason I put this is because sometimes what happens, the X-ray will show a lot more abnormality than when you actually open up. It might not necessarily be the same, especially with the left side. If you see, looks like the whole uh, uh, tibial uh, condyle on one side, especially the medial side is gone. So this is the side view. So the points what I thought we'll consider pre-op is whether we are going to do unilateral or bilateral surgery in the same sitting. Since there is a severe varus deformity, uh, how are you going to correct that? And then uh, bone loss medially on both sides. So obviously, like we discussed, graft, wedges or augments and whether we are going to use constrained or non-constrained. So I would always keep some constrained implant as a backup. Uh, the idea will be to avoid it as much as possible. So these are the points which I took into consideration uh, pre-op. So in terms of the considerations, yeah, so severe virus, both knees, patient was fit and well. And so I decided for both knee surgery because the severity of so much is hardly able to walk uh, short distances. So if we do one and then try to do the other one, obviously there'll be mobility issues and the patient is fit and well. So I thought a bilateral knee surgery will probably be a good idea here. And obviously the, the virus was fixed with an FFD, but we were able to get full correction. And obviously we follow the basic techniques of uh, gap balancing, uh, pie crusting, removal of all the osteophytes, medial soft tissues I released in a very uh, graded manner because we, we don't want to release too much and uh, lead to some sort of uh, MCL instability. Now the right sided, obviously the, the defect was an uncontained one, but it was around 8 to 10 millimeters. So I used a bone graft with a screw for the medial plateau and uh, a long stem. The left side, it was contained and it was around 10 millimeters. So I was able to get away without a stem or a graft. So what I did was I, I used this technique of a little bit of lateralizing of the TBL plateau and cementation. And then there are a lot of studies where they have shown that if you can get away without a stem and a, a constrained implant, it's always better. There are a lot of studies where they show you can downsize a little bit, be a little more lateral. That will be good enough if you can get away with it. So uh, these are the points which I took into consideration. And then this is the post-op x-ray. Yeah. That's the right side. And then that's the left side. So that's what I was talking about. So if you can see, I was able to fill that up, get some good back and then lateralize just a bit. That's the AP view. And for the right side, I had to use a, a graft and then a stem. And then uh, that's the lateral view. And uh, that's the patient uh, day seven post-op. So he is able to do, do full knee range of movement and the deformity is corrected uh, fully. Thank you. Thank you. I have a point to make here. Okay. If you are putting in a graft and you're mobilizing the patient immediately post-operatively, you need to put in a stem extender because otherwise the graft will go into a virus collapse because it it will uh, the the blood supply to the graft is will take a while to get back and till that time you know there can be fragmentation and or non-union of the graft so it needs to be protected. So also also one more just to add upon uh, whenever we are planning for a graft the bed has to be prepared properly yes. and the majority of the time the medial side will be a sclerosed bone. And the more you start preparing, you will be trying and getting a big defect. So you sometimes suddenly you will see that your graft will not be sufficient enough to go for a screw fixation. Then you might go for a metal augment for a, such a situation. So whenever we are preparing the bed, you have to be have a backup of an augment or sometimes even a sleeve, which may, may not be that common, but still as a backup. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Can you stop the sharing? Yeah.
So next speaker is uh, Dr. M. Manoharan from Pondicherry. Uh, good evening, sir. Puducherry, sorry. Yeah, Puducherry. Yeah, Pondicherry also fine, sir. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good evening, sir. Uh, please. Is it my screen is visible, sir? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir. Actually, in my system, uh, my uh, video is not working, so I am just uh, presenting without video, sir. Maybe my phone it is showing my video, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Very much. Very very go clear. On. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, straight away, I will go to the case. Uh, I would like to thank all the organizing pan panel for giving this opportunity. So this is my case. Is it moving, sir? No. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yes, sir. Fifty-five-year-old gentleman with a controlled diabetic who had a complaining of pain, swelling, deformity of knee for right knee for five years duration, and patient had a neck of femur fracture two years before in the same limb, and for which hemiarthroplasty was done elsewhere, and he was able to manage for another quite two years, and patient had a swelling and pain got aggravated for the last one year, and uh, as well as difficult in walking and activities of daily living. On examination, right lower limb, hip showed the healed surgical scar without signs of any infection. Diffuse swelling present over the entire knee joint with the gross patellar tap positive. Valgus deformity of 20 degree present, which is not correctable. And fixed flexion deformity of 15 degree present. Further range of movement is only up to 80 degrees present. MCL is intact. There is no medial laxity. The extensive sinual thickening noted on the middle of the knee joint. So this is the uh, clinical picture as a walking video. And patient was almost walking with a stiff valgus with shortening. Shortening will be probably due to the hip hemiarthroplasty. Shortening and lengthening. Yeah. yeah. So this is the x-ray. Uh, sorry for the, I am not able to get the full length x-ray. I am not able to recollect the uh, pictures from my gallery. So this is the X-ray available, and hemiarthroplasty side they have cut more neck, so that I think uh, that will give the information that the for the shortening. This is the X-ray, sir, preoperative X-ray. Can I proceed, sir? I will will wait for the discussion, sir. So just wait. Wait, wait for a minute. Uh, so definitely, its case is open for the discussion. Who will take the case, Doctor Jose, Doctor Narend? Yeah, so this is a fixed valgus and a moderate degree. And uh, the hemiarthroplasty, which has been done on a proximal femur, uh, which we have to be careful only in terms of passing the intramedullary rod while cutting the tissue femur. Otherwise, I have no other issue. And if you want, you can use a, a navigation or an extra medullary system if you want to use, or you can use a short rod, you know, if it's going to be appropriate. So but my plan is. Have you required a merchant view in this case or not? Yeah, merchants view will help, uh, you know, in terms of, especially the valgus knee, uh, it will help for lateral contracture and lateral tilt of the patella. Now, uh, the, the important things to, you know, underlie here in this case, kind of cases in valgus is, uh, you know, whether it's correctable or not clinically, and then the surgical approach. And a lot has been discussed about the lateral approach, but, uh, you know, I go with a normal standard approach, which I normally do every day, which is the medial parapatella. Distal femur cut, normal cut, but I will not, you know, cut the lateral condyle, which looks like hypoplastic. And I also have to be very careful in terms of my rotation because the posterior lateral condyle will be hypoplastic. And on the tibial side, you know, I make sure that you know, I don't cut too much tibia on my first, first time when I'm going to cut, but otherwise it's going to be a standard extra medullary jig cut. Take a lesser cut with about maybe two millimeters on the lateral side. If you have a lateral defect, which usually happens on the postal lateral aspect. After that, I put my spacer and get the uh, lateral release as much needed sequentially from anterior to posteriorly. That's what usually I do. And, uh, you know, this looks like a standard implant and a standard technique. We should be able to do that. Yes, yes, Ashit. And I, before you make a distal femoral cut, uh, make sure that you take into consideration the remodeling of the distal femur. See, if you see the distal femur in the AP view, 
there is a remodeling of that at the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction so you may have to reduce your valgus distal femoral valgus angle so standard is what we take is about 5 6 degrees here you may have to take either 3 or 4 degrees depending on your calculation yeah uh can i just uh, dirish yeah please please sir i think uh, we have to learn a lesson that every valgus knee please take the skyline skyline view that is absolutely must we must pass this message to all the surgeons reason is you will know what is happening to the lateral patellar femur arthritis so one important message from that x ray is if the patella is subluxated or dislocated your medial approach is not going to be a, uh, easy so actually that is the patient you need to do a lateral approach cablish approach and it is not that difficult because we are afraid that's why that is a problem number 2 very important to take the stress x ray of this patients how do you know it is a fixed unless you have know the stress x ray what is amount of correction because once you give a stress x ray you will know how is amount of opening and you will also see configuration of the lateral condyle so that you can reduce the valgus angle what ashi was telling that is another important thing and under anesthesia please examine these patients just don't go and just do a uh, approach you examine as a surgeon and see how much amount of uh, correction you are getting because most of this valgus will get corrected once you give anesthesia that is very important important for the, uh, for of us and with a fixed flexion and valgus and a fixed rigidity and a patella subluxating i think best approach is lateral approach so, so that's the point well taken so that's why right. i asked that the merchant you must uh, if any valgus ni if uh, surgeon absolutely is... absolutely thank you so what you did uh, sir uh, uh, this is how i have done some planning sir this is how i measured so i i have found that preoperatively there is a there is no there is not only the lateral tibial condyle depression almost like a medial condyle also has uh, some defect and there is a huge medial osteophyte which is uh, seeing under the mcl so that may be the threat for the uh, mcl integrity and this is how i analyze the lateral view so in lateral view this is the lateral condyle it is so much uh, like a cup and saucer this is the medial condyle defect so with this any fixed valgus deformity these are the problems will be there asymmetric instability with bone defect oh, sir, sir. Or and, yes sir i can i will proceed yes Because so these are my problems in this case stem is inside the femur so intramuralgic i used a short stem and partially correctable m valgus with intact mcl so it was intraoperatively partially correctable then tibial bone defect on both sides coming to the approach i used a standard medial parapetlar approach and uh, it will be a problem challenge will be there with the rotation of uh, femoral component and order of release also we have to be very careful and this how i proceeded and this is the intraoperative finding so while doing a uh, uh, because it was only giving up to 80 degree flexion my knee joint that uh, patella tendon was started bleeding <coughs> out so i put a additional pin to protect it then i have cut the minimal tibial cut and it was shown with uh, contained defect on the lateral condyle as well as uh, uncontained defect in the medial condyle so it was less than 5 mm so i managed with a lateral bicresting of the uh, lcl as well as tfl then managed with standard uh, pfc sigma with the tibial stem extension and ten size Uh, inserts and during this uh, actually one mistake was happened as it is automatically releasing tunicate so suddenly it started release during my cementation so i was not able to have the control so that is why i think it is having a less cementation in my post op x ray so come on sir what, what did you do to the defects which was one side was uncontained medial side was uncontained right yes sir So the both you... uh, actually i have um, uh, managed with only cement sir that's looking any comment uh, rajkumar no it's uh, actually uh, well done probably asit uh, brought it out the point uh, probably on the uncontained the side uh, he could have used a screw augmentation so okay, would have sir. would have made a little uh, additional support because of the weight bearing axis so that that only the only point here otherwise it is uh, well done the one key point here is in these kind of valgus knees uh, surgeon should make sure that they are not increasing the uh, insert size too much that that means the bone cut has been done 
uh, in a bigger way. So the bone cuts has to be as minimal as possible and the uh, insert size also should not go up because the more the insert size, the chance of common peroneal palsy and then the tightness and then the balancing problem happens, then flexion deformity or extension correction. So many things happen just by making a mistake of doing more cuts, more bone. So in a valgus knee, the message should be that keep the mini cuts as minimal as possible and you can go back and cut it whenever you want it. So that should be the message here. This is after two months of uh, surgery, sir. Due uh, to the shortening in the hip, uh, patient is having still limping, sir. Yes. Uh, I don't think you are the considering the shortening. It is not a shortening. So, uh, hardly any major shortening. The, yes. knee, the Because it has a valgus knee, it looks like that in a pre-operative. You thought that it is shortening, but it is not. There was no major shortening. So Also, FFD was there. Yes, yes. So, don't worry about it. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. It will improve. Uh, you are done a great job. Good job. Good job. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the uh, yes. opportunity, sir. Thank you once again, sir. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you. Can you stop, Yes, sir. So, my next speaker is uh, from Coimtur, or Dr. U. R. Azan. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Is this, my screen is visible, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, good evening to all uh, respected seniors. And uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to present my uh, case on totally arthroplasty and extraticular deformity. And she is a 64 year old female. Just put it full, go to full, full, full screen. Presentation mode. Is it okay, sir? Yeah, fine. Absolutely. Yeah, she is a 64 years old female with a known case of rheumatoid. And she presented to us with uh, chronic uh, bilateral severe varus deformity, but more significant on the right side. But patient had a stress fracture, but she could not recognize that a stress fracture was there, but she was continued to um, ambulating with this kind of deformity. To, yeah. And this is her uh, clinical x-ray, uh, bilateral uh, AP and lateral view with the skyline. And this is a scanogram picture. It shows that uh, there is a proximal tibia stress fracture and it is malinated. It's been a chronic uh, issue and patient was not aware that the patient had a stress fracture with this kind of deformity. This was a preoperative x-ray. So the left knee is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, I managed with... Uh, wait, wait, we will discuss first. Uh, yes. Who will take the case? Dr. Patnaik. No, he is actually he is not available. He is uh, not well, it seems. Okay. Ravi, Ravi can take. Um. Uh. The uh, stress fracture is healed, no, doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I mean, as uh, as the mal, uh, what what was the uh, this is deformity, extraarticular deformity? Angle the angle, sir. Stress fracture healed. Stress fracture, sir. It is malinated. Yeah. Yeah. Did you calculate the deformity and how far it was from the joint line? Uh, it's almost around uh, uh, 15, 15 centimeters. Okay. So the, the I would like, I mean, if there is a virus, uh, gross virus with uh, defect and it's uh, tricompartmental severe arthritis on the right side. Okay. Anyway, we're, we're dealing with the right side, no, doctor? Yes. Right. yes. Yeah. Yes. So the uh, there is no fixed flexion deformity. No, sir. There is no fixed flexion deformity. Okay. So the, then the, everything should be uh, uh, standard uh, uh, femoral distal femoral cut and uh, uh, standard uh, proximal tibial cut. Uh, as the extraarticular deformity is far away from the joint and it it yeah yeah uh, it appeared me for me it is less than. Uh, 20 degrees yeah it's very less like maybe around 15 degrees so we can ignore it yeah, we can ignore it and do with the standard cuts and the medial bone reconstruction with uh, 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 either bone graft uh, or or the screws with uh, cement whatever it takes uh, should be fine with the we can Amir? Yeah. Rajkumar, thank you. One of the main issue what I found is uh, because there is an extra tubular deformity which is far away from joint and we are correcting that extraarticular deformity in the intraarticularly, you might end up in doing a significant amount of medial release. That's the one issue. 
and the one is she is rheumatoid and bone is very osteoporotic and even if you to build up the as definitely there will be going to be a big defect in the medial side and once you definitely then you have to put a stem then and the main concern that i'm thinking about the, the my stem will go on about the lateral cortex or the tibia i want never able to bypass the structure so i had to prepare with a short stubby stem like 13 into 30 mm cemented stem would be my my choice in that case and definitely the medial side either i'll put a met- because i don't think the bone have a good union potential because of she's rheumatoid the severe osteoporosis i might use a augments or screws with cement depending upon the depth of the medial defect dr narayan please yeah so uh, this is an extra articular deformity so whether we can do it intra articularly or do you have to do an extra articular correction that is the question here yes now that can be answered if you draw a line along the distal tibia which passes you know proximally onto the tibial plateau if that line goes lateral to the tibial plateau you will not be able to correct that intra articularly exactly. whereas if it is inside the tibial plateau you will be able to correct it however there are some studies lot of them korean studies for example if you use navigation most of these deformities even even if it is going outside the tibial plateau you can correct intra articularly itself and these deformities are easier to correct if they are in tibia and more difficult in distal femur because it's in tibia it's okay now another thing here is uh, if that fracture is nicely healed completely solid we are okay otherwise you know we may have to because it is a stress fracture it is not like a, a, a trauma deformity if it is still weak probably we may have to correct the deformity and pass the extension stem through the uh, the stress fracture so that you know we have stabilized the fracture as well and if we are going to do that i think you know that will be much easier than correcting the deformity intra articularly absolutely correct most, absolutely. Uh, most operative x rays or intra pictures do you have uh, yes sir so let us proceed sir for the next slide yuraj proceed what did you do x ray this is a <laughs> standard sir with the uh, i managed with a uh, uh, standard implants with extension stuff for left side so this is the Uh, challenges which i plan for this case right knee the pre operative planning assessment and pre op planning for deformity choice whether to go for a single stage or two two stage corrections and anticipating there some post op complications so this is my pre operative planning it shows that the total varus of around 32 degrees the joint line which is contrary to the varus intra articular is 17 but this uh, manipulated proximal tibia is contributing almost 15 degrees of varus to my Uh, intraarticular deformity so if it calculates it is a quite significant deformity so i thought uh, better to address the deformity first then to go for intraarticular release otherwise as uh, one of the panelists correctly mentioned we have to go for very extensive medial release so this is my uh, planning so under the cm i took a lateral close wedge osteotomy from the exactly at the malignated part of the tibia and the same level i removed the wedge of fibula so this made my job very easy and become the deformity is almost 15 degrees in the joint now and it became a standard uh, totally arthroplasty but, but during the preparation and uh, you can see i prepared the canal really both when i opened it i prepared this canal for a to pa- pass my uh, uh, stem extension so it made my job easy it was a bit sclerotic because of already united so i reamed completely both proximal and distal i prepared like uh, passing a nail so my job was very easy then once i prepared a standard tick here so i passed the regular stem this is my post op x ray but before that i stabilized the uh, tibia with the dcp plate and distal 3 and proximal unicortical just to make the rotational stability and i left the plate in situ i didn't remove that because i don't want to get any stress strikes there but this stem i used was a 12 into 150 mm stem uh, but this was quite rotationally stable stem and uh, this is the immediate post op picture sir uh, Sorry. Yeah, I think uh, quite a good job. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a uh, very yeah. good, very good, and uh, definitely as it was discussed, this is a very good case for definitely correcting the uh, malunited uh, stress fracture, bringing it to neutral alignment, and then putting a stem. The only point here is I would have just to add upon the stem size could have been little longer. Here yeah. the stem is slightly shorter because I know th- in this Smith and Nephew slit stem, this is the maximum length. If you had used a uh, Johnson and Johnson, you have a one sixty stem. It would have crossed a little more. And when you get a good purchase, sometimes you may not need an additional one. 
but whenever you are doing an osteotomy mal united uh, stress fracture osteotomy it is better to add a just a unicortical plate that is always better absolutely yes totally agree nice so thank you great job so, uh, one more point on this so, uh, sorry um, a couple of things because it has been done openly you know because the osteotomy will have to open the fracture site i would usually add the bone graft taken from the distal femur and proximal tibia yeah, that's absolutely. one thing i learned second thing i'll also do is make this stem little longer until the medullary canal is little wider because one of my patient had a stress fracture at the tip of this uh, stem with the smallest fall so i think you know that's another point as as the stem becomes longer and longer it becomes little rigid construct and these patients come back with a periprosthetic which is again going to be difficult uh, situation Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, can you stop sharing? Uh, yeah, please. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Kana. He is from Jammu. Please share your screen. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I hope it is visible. The screen is visible now, sir. Uh, not yet, can I? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for giving the opportunity. To this case. So my case is uh, a total knee replacement done in a post tubercular arthritis. Uh, so a fifty-five-year-old diabetic male. Can I? Present- can I? Your screen is not visible. You have to share the screen. That green button down. in the lower panel there is one green arrow mark facing yes. up does that in the lower in the bottom there is one yes i have Uh, is it visible now sir ah yeah yeah that's right yeah a 55 year old diabetic male presented to the opd with the pain and limping of the left knee since more than 2 years so he had a history of atd and dec for tuberculosis of the same knee for more than 5, 1.5 years so he was diagnosed earlier on the basis of uh, blood test and mri no biopsy however was taken so uh, currently he, he was having no constitutional symptoms so this is an mri of the left knee taken 2 years back and uh, Uh, at present uh, the clinical examination he had a severe intelligent gait uh, very stiff knee range of motion was 30 to 70 degrees uh, no varus and varus or ap instability skin was normal and uh, there was a mild shortening also so sir let me play yes. the video of the clinical examination so there is the only range of motion he was having very stiff knee so, but there was no uh, Virus or virus instability. So the current investigations were: sir, CBC was normal, ESR was fifty, uh, CRP was uh, normal, knee aspiration I did uh, preoperatively. There was a dry tap, and MRI some edema and synovitis was still present, which was done again. Sir, I am I am audible, sir. Yes, yes, very much. Please yeah. have. So, sir, these were the pre-op X-rays we took just just before the surgery. so uh, should i stop sir yeah yes ashit yes okay so this is again um, uh, residual uh, post tuberculous arthritis as we call it um, i mean obviously from the clinical picture and uh, the lab laboratory tests you know it shows that there is no active disease that you have to make sure that there is no active disease by doing uh, pro calcium levels also that crp is also fine i mean crp you said is normal but make sure that uh, this uh, are uh, uh, normal before you plan the surgery 
as far as the surgery is concerned you know it is a flex flexion deformity as we discussed in the first case that is something that you have to follow those steps to release uh, the distal femur and the posterior aspect of the femur the soft tissues and the osteophytes which we don't see here much it may be just the soft tissues however there is on the tibial side there is that little uh, i mean there is a cavity which uh, we can see on the x ray uh, which uh, you have to be prepared that if in tibial cut there is a cavity that opens as a contained defect you may have to be ready for uh, putting it in bone graft and put a, a stem just to cover that bone but apart from that whenever you open make sure that you do that thorough synovectomy and send that entire synovium sample for histopathology and microbiology again yes ashish uh, they must start preoperatively if it was proved akt they must start preoperatively akt at least minimum for 3 weeks 3 weeks minimum and all four drugs four drugs before we embark on this surgery of this patients because there is always some amount of minor my, uh, microorganism which you will not be able to pick up and the mri actually we uh, rather than we study actually you must consult your mri uh, expert actually because there is a lot of things which have come uh, with the tubercular arthritis tubercular arthritis especially in the hip also so that is one important message that akt must be started before this uh, this surgical intervention sir even after he has completed one and a half years 100%, of course earlier 100 even at 10 years if the even 10 years back this patient had a tubercular arthritis and it was proved it has to be started there is no question So there are two more points I wanted to add here. One is that this patient's ESR is still high, very high, and also his MRI shows that a continued inflammatory reaction. Yeah. Now it could well be a multi-drug resistant TB. You see, yes. which has been seen in so many places. Absolutely. So even though you have treated them so much, if you do a TKR without confirming that, the ongoing destruction will make that uh, TKR fail very quickly. so i think you know we'll have to plan for that as uh, dr pachar has saying in the previous adt and uh, reculturing them for the mdt and if necessary we may have to continue that for a long time that's one point if there is a persistent infection and uh, if you know we think the ongoing tb infection is there another option which i had done in a hip patient was uh, doing an excision arthroplasty with a spacer and then going back and doing a, a replacement Yeah, and uh, Dr. Narayan, and just uh, for discussion Except point TV, of view, yeah, that's what I think we're going to tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No discussion point of view. You said the chance of multi-drug resistance is high in this situation. Not so in this situation, in this country generally. No, yeah. no, yeah, but even if you assume that uh, already two years he has taken, and now if you are again thinking of multi-drug resistant and giving him AKT four again. so that means that akt4 should not work in this situation Maha, no 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 see if it is an mdt you will not give him akt4 ah that is you, the point you will yeah. consult your microbiologist local and he will usually change them to a second line drugs so and in say, this when you operate you take the sina we take the yeah. tissue sina we mentioned for everything today we have a lot of newer biology uh, uh, molecular yes. pathology so great thing is has happening in this country yeah. so you will be able to know what is it, is it drug resistance also rifamycin yeah. and isonex yeah comes uh, in gene expert and few other thing ultra gene expert and So, like bro, I say so many. So we have to wait till the culture report and histopathological examination report comes. Yeah. And Chauri, based sir, on that, yeah, yes, Mrnal. What is the role of preoperative aspiration in sending it for gene expert in such tuberculosis? No, he has already done. He right. said it's a result dry trial. Right. That's why otherwise that is the most ideal way. That is the most ideal way that because he could not get any fluid from there. Would you, in that case, consider an arthroscopic sinus? Yeah, yeah. You can do a sinus. You can take a biopsy also. Biopsy is better option than aspiration. Yes, yes. yes. I, last week, one case I stuck in Jaipur and uh, just did the arthroscopic biopsy and sent for the TB. Uh, the next. So part. all this biology, molecular biology, we are talking about can be done by arthroscopic sinus. You will get good sample. You have those two, three weeks, four weeks to get the yeah. results back. Start the patient on medical treatment. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, as such, joint replacement is not a contraindication in non-active tuberculosis. So, as we are doing during the procedure, we can send for all cultures, gene yeah. expert, line probe, say, and wait for the cultures and start the specific drugs. That would be better. Sorry, sir. What antibiotic would you like to add in the cement in such cases? Uh, you no, know, the people have tried streptomycin, but I am not very, very keen on that. Keen on that. 
but I don't know whether it is a thermostable or uh, really don't know. So people have, uh, especially in the hips, cemented hips, uh, in our country to name Dr. Bosley has done a good work on this and he used the streptomycin in the cement. So sir, what about using stimulant with streptomycin in such situations? I think stimulant is not a good option, but uh, streptomycin you can. You can have a, actually wash also with streptomycin. Stimulant sometimes what happens, they start woozing and then you secondary infection develops, then you are in trouble. Trouble. Yes, yes. Trouble. And second thing, uh, in the tuberculosis, it doesn't have glycocalyx, like yeah. other bacterial infection. So no, the formation are... of the biofilm is very, un... I mean, biofilm doesn't happen in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Yeah, I agree. So that we is don't reason... worry about adding yeah. uh, antibiotics and all. Yeah, so yeah. We should worry, uh, as we are taking the entire diseased part of the bones and also the synomium, <laughs> so there will be less chance of any persistence of the infection. If it is there also, we can treat with AKT. If the only thing, if it is active, you should not do. I am talking about now 25 years, 30 years back. I did a couple of knees. My boss did a couple of knees. And post operative when we saw the synovium was born, we sent it for, we did a TKR at that time. And we sent a synovium, it came out tubercle. And luckily, immediately, we started anticox and nothing is, went wrong. So you are lucky that tubercle organism has three important factors. One, they are slow-growing organism. Second, they are possibacteria. Third is, you said there is no biofilm. That is another one important finding. And today, we have a fantastic drugs available. And that is the reason we are able to uh, come out of this complication. So we have we have done this path. Nothing to worry about going ahead. But be scientific, what, what I want you to uh, put it. Be scientific. So, sir, if we go from your experience of doing those joints where you incidentally found it was a tuberculosis and you gave yeah. him AKT. So yeah. now what is the point in giving an AKT pre-op when this yes, patient yeah, already yeah. had one and a half year of AKT? Yes, yes. I will tell you. The reason is there is some pockets of remaining which will never come out because it is a very slow growing organism and it is a dormant disease. So you will never pick up uh, Ashish with this. And that's why it is uh, better to protect them by uh, AKT of two to three weeks. In the hip also we do it, knee also we do it. And then post-op continue for how long? Oh, post-op, suppose, uh, yes. suppose that patient comes negative, all the factors are negative. You continue for another two to three months and stop it. Stop it. And suppose if the one uh, one becomes a positive culture, then you continue for uh, 14 months or 16 months, depends on your uh, uh, the uh, medicine yes, man, uh, medical yeah. man. So usually, by and large, in our India, most of the surgeons have used up to 12 to 16 months, that is a 12 to 16 months uh, of AKT. But if it is negative, stop it at about two to three months time. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, so this was the current MRI. Uh, sir, the preoperative apprehension was a stiff knee, TBL bone defect, intraoperative infection pus, and uh, chances of postoperative infection. Patient was counseled about the issues and stage procedure if necessary. So the intraoperative medial parapetal arthrotomy was done. Patella was very adherent to the both the femoral condyles. Had to use an osteotome to make a groove and then work gently. So more than usual thickened intrafetlar uh, intrafetlar fat was found. As contrary to some uh, rheumatoid arthritic knee, the synovium was very hard in consistency and it was extending well above the suprapetlar pouch. Quadriceps were very firmly tied to the femur and had to do a periosteal stripping up to five, 7 to 10 centimeters or even more during and even after the completion of the, just before the closure. Uh, so the medial and lateral gutters were clear carefully as to not to damage the collaterals. No infective granulation tissue or pus was found. It was very difficult to subluxate the tibia anteriorly. Lateral tibial condyle was more posterior as compared to the medial. Both the tibial condyles were symmetrically worn out more so and the central uh, eminence was prominent. So standard 8 mm uh, and uh, the femur cut was taken more 11 mm with a 5 degree valgus. Uh, sir, medial soft tissue was, uh, here it is a picture, I, it may not be very good. Sir, the petal is very adherent to the femur. And even after the com completion of the uh, procedure, I was not able to fully correct the FFD. So after uh, after cementing, here is the picture that I am even not able to, some uh, 10 degrees of FFD is still remaining. Even after uh, correcting the, taking more distal cuts as well as aggressively stripping the periosteum of the distal femur as well, sir. So I was relying more on the post-operatively. Intraoperatively, cultures were sent and specimen for histopathology. 
no growth of organisms after 72 hours and uh, in horn histopathology it was a non specific synovitis and it was there there was no evidence of any granuloma or neoplasia seen sir intra articular drain was kept wood inter infiltration the cocktail and a water uh, water tight closure was done sir i may add that uh, due to the stripping i only added a intra articular drain and it was like uh, uh, in 24 hours it was more than 300 to 400 ml or even more so post operatively i use a cefuroxime six doses seven days of linzolid and i have put the patient on three weeks of ofloxacin epidural top up cpm uh, echo any show the x ray post op started the next day aggressive physiotherapy done yes sir. Uh, sir uh, uh, just a minute sir sir here is the on the stitch removal on the 15th day the ffd has reduced uh and he has got uh, flexion also so uh, i think post of x ray it is still i think oh uh, sir just a minute i'll show you the post of x ray the pressure sir while he shows the post of x ray Uh, any immunocompromised, like especially tubercular patient, it is better to send fungal culture also in trop. Yes, sir. Sir, I, uh, can I see? Uh, can you see the post yeah. of X-ray, sir? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. We can. Yeah, yeah, sir. Here is the post of X-ray. I have not resurfaced the patella and uh, did a usual uh, TKR. So, sir, here is that. Good. Thank you. Any comment from the panel, Dr. Rajkumar? Yeah, yes, uh, it is actually well done uh, for the uh, complexity and the uh, uh, um, so the doubts he had of whether to start ATT, how to proceed. The flexion deformity was the one which is really a challenge in this case to uh, do it uh, because of the lot of additions. Unlike in the regular flexion deformities, so he has done a good job and uh, the maximum release he has done and probably because of the uh, residual uh, flexion deformity, he might be. having a small deformity flexion deformity post operatively but i think it's a well done job great thank you great. any sir, i have not yet started a post operative attt but any i'll start now sir, after this disc hearing the discussion uh, i think now with the uh, cultures and everything negative i don't think uh, he needs any post operative uh, akt or uh, anything now it's proven that he does i think uh, rajkumar he, he must be he must protect it If he is recently operated, you must start AKT for at least for three months. Three months. If <coughs> uh, histology diagnosis or previous, which was there already, and also there is no mention about the TB culture. You see, he has got no culture at seventy-two hours, yeah, yeah. but not after four weeks. Yeah. So we need to go a little longer time, but, uh, and uh, we have to extend the culture because it is not going to be in a couple of days. You yeah. have to wait for TB culture for at least for a period of uh, six yes, weeks. Six so weeks. I think it is better to protect. We are not go doing any harm for this patient. Yeah. Uh, he is operated. If his uh, liver functions are all right, you, he should start. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, sir. So next. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kanav. Thank you. So next is speaker from Bangalore, Dr. Basavraj, CM. Hi, good evening, everybody. Once again, uh, my talk. Just give us. Uh, is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. My talk is going to be on a windswept deformity. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Basavraj. I am heading the orthopedic department at BGS Lenigals Global Hospital, Bengaluru. So, um, it's a 55-year-old lady who presented to us with severe uh, uh, windswept deformity. That's uh, valgus on the right and varus on the left. Mm -hmm. um, she had uh, also uh, very bad pain. She was really it was disabling. Almost one year, she couldn't walk long distances. She was home uh, uh, home uh, bound. and uh, you can see the she also had a severe uh, flexion deformity of both her knees this was her uh, x rays that's the lateral view 
and on table just wanted to show you how much of instability was there so demonstrating the defect on the medial tibial uh, plateau this is on the left knee this was the knee with the varus deformity varus deformity and this is the right knee this, on the right knee it was the uh, defect on the lateral tibial plateau and the uh, it was almost looking like a horse you know saddle the the proximal tibia and uh, this is a video showing the instability of the right knee what was the status of the mcl and lcl collaterals so, so what do we do okay. so case is open for the panel who will take the case general yeah. yes did you get an mri yes, preoperatively right. did you get an mri preoperatively to assess the collaterals About, apart from the ankle Hello. assessment, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, yes, yes. So I am asking. Hello. Did you, Doctor Basuraj? We can hear you. Um, I was just asking. Did you get an MRI preoperatively apart from your clinical assessment for the collaterals? Because I can't the hear. Oh, okay, Mirnal. I think uh, there is some audio problem with them. You go ahead, Dad. You. No, no, no. Sorry, I can hear now. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. So I was asking, apart from the clinical assessment, did you get an MRI for collaterals? Because the collaterals are too much stressed, and also there are a lot of bone defects. Uh, no. And subluxation. No, no MRI. Just clinical assessment. Okay. so uh, obviously it's a vincer deformity we need to go ahead and build up the defects do minimal release and obviously keep constraint implants including hinges ready in such severe situations especially on the left side where the tibia and the femur are almost subluxed completely on the lateral view um, anything else uh, someone wants to add uh, routine knee i don't think no is going to be a solution in such situations i know it is painful but just get an mri of the spine just to uh, we we got the x rays we evaluated the spine it was normal spine and the hips no no, no only for, on, only one point about uh, i i know i know we are, we we want to uh, see if there's a charcoals or some yeah, sort of a, yeah. Yeah. i know it is painful so it cannot that was evaluated that's normal okay no oh, uh, with this type of dislocation i agree with ashay that you must get an mri done because this type of dislocation does not happen uh, with osteoarthritic knees so be careful with this type of knees is a anterior subluxation tibia yes be careful with this patients maybe we should get a synovial biopsy as uh, recommended And, by dr anava uh, during uh, surgery to rule uh, out charcoals I am not uh, going against your clinical examination. When I saw her walking on the right side and the valgus side, I think she had a foot drop, foot drop on that side. Anyhow, please go ahead. We did a standard T care, unconstrained, so bone grafted the defect, and uh, uh, clinically also the collaterals were intact pre-op. as well as on table i could see that the collateral mechanism was intact so unconstrained posterior stabilized just to offload the reconstruction we have used these stems so that's lateral that's we used navigation so got a decent uh, correction of the mechanical axis and uh, that's one uh, six weeks post op it's not a decent correction it is a very good correction okay. excellent excellent thank you thank you thank you and that's one year and that's But, one year post op 
but the right foot drop still exist it exists. looks like that's okay that's okay <laughs> so so it was there pre op also because dr pachare picked it up post pre op so yeah. i'll i'll tell you one thing i'll be honest she had a fall just 2 to 3 days prior to the the okay. surgery and uh, she developed this foot drop it was a peripheral nerve lesion and i didn't want to add on all those things uh, you know because it will dilute the take home message in this is the importance of collateral mechanism so i'm not stressing on anything else That's here okay. so she had a, a foot drop a right sided foot drop yeah. and we waited we thought it was um, neuropraxia it will recover um but then uh, it didn't it's 3 years now 3 and a half years so it has not recovered we have done the nerve reconduction and any nerve conduction studies and all that so probably we may have to but she's managing with a foot drop splint and uh, she's fine but we have given and discussed the option of uh, tendon transfers now is that gives us a clue that it could be neuropathy because no, no. So can you stop sharing because simultaneously of because of oh. fall just two days and uh, prior to the surgery she had a fall Oh. and uh, she had this uh, foot drop dr basuraj can right. you stop sharing while discussing right. can you stop sharing dr basuraj see if it is a one closed minute, injury one minute, one minute. if it is a closed injury and patient has developed neuropraxia probably that should resolve it is now 3 years so one, definitely we are looking at something else no, this I is not neuropraxia one, one, ah yeah stop ah yes 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 there yes. is you can invite the next speaker in the meeting to dr basuraj you've done very good job but i would still like to use constrained implants in such situations because of all uh, risk of uh, late mcl uh, laxity and ruptures you know in these especially in the valgus knees so i think uh, that consideration should be kept in mind always doing such severe so i had kept that on the uh, on the shelf but the collateral ligaments were intact i have a three and a half year follow up i have been following her up regularly i have the extras at three, three years now so she is absolutely fine and uh, dr pachare you really picked up that point uh, of foot drop she she has that foot drop we have discussed yeah, that's about okay. that's okay yeah and uh, i think that's okay you have done a good job uh, and and uh, less constraint is better because you don't require to use too much of constraint if the constraint yes if yes. you have good uh, ligament i think you should uh, should be okay and if 3 years she has not ruptured she won't rupture she's don't do it going to rupture no no she is not, not going to and also opening was partially due to defects bone defect yes That's everything why. is is uh, yes take home message i didn't want to that uh, present the foot drop and everything and, and i for the char codes neuropathic thing we had evaluated her spine and uh, there was no oh, and she had severe pain and all those things it was not like that she didn't have pain and all that so she was in fact on overan uh, diclofenac for almost like his son was telling almost every week uh, she was on injectable overan and also oral uh, acetophenac you should you should intraoperatively send up synovial biopsy and if it shows bone pieces that is somehow diagnostic of charcots that is what dr anavat has taught us It's organized joint with the uh, bone pieces. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, next speaker is uh, Alachi Dakrani uh, Gautam. There is him. No, no, Doctor Basuraj is. Uh, oh, Sorry. Is so the screen visible, sir? Oh, not, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Rashuma, just guide him. I think. Uh, Anil. Yes, sir. Are you able to locate the share screen button? Yes, sir. I'm just clicking on it.
so in uh, yes yeah it should be the screen visible sir yeah, yeah go to full presentation yeah, yeah. mode yes yes yeah, yeah. Uh, good evening, myself, Dr. Anil Gautam from uh, Haradhan Hospital, Polaji. Uh, today we will be uh, seeing cases about uh, orthorophic assisted uh, extraarticular deformity correction in uh, TKR in various uh, ONEs. So this is a case of 75-year-old male who had bilateral osteoarthritis of the knee joint with various deformity, I had difficulty in performing activities of daily living, an economically poor patient, uh, clinically his range of movement were between 5 to 90 degrees. This is his clinical picture and uh, both knees, AP and lateral views on weight bearing. Uh, so we will consider only about his left knee because he came for pain in the left knee. Uh, this is his full length uh, scanogram of uh, lower limb. Uh, so the treatment options are Can I go ahead with the presentation, sir? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we have planned for uh, lift total knee replacement, and we have planned for correcting the extra optical deformity with uh, orthofix external fixator, which we routinely use for uh, high tibial osteotomies. Uh, so preoperatively, we have uh, uh, looked for the, the for entire lens scanogram, and also we located the cora was at the proximal tibia. Uh, so we thought of correcting the deformity extra articularly so that uh, uh, we could uh, bring back the biomechanical access to the normal uh, range. So we do a lot of uh, HTOs uh, with the uh, uh, orthofix applicator. So with, uh, we thought of the correcting the deformity extra articularly with the uh, orthofix uh, assistance. So we opened up the definitely with medial parapetalar approach. Uh, this is the picture after exposing the knee joint. Uh, see, we connected the orthofix external fixator uh, in the two horizontal pins in the proximal tibia. The horizontal pins are just inserted in such a way that anterior and posteriorly that won't interfere when we are doing the tibial intramedullary preparation, so that it won't interfere the uh, tibial stem preparation. So, and, uh, and two vertical pins connected uh, to the uh, distal shaft of tibia. Uh, once the uh, the proximal and distal uh, pins are connected, this makes the the tibial site uh, a stable fragment. So once the ortho, this is the picture after connecting the orthofix uh, external fixator. Uh, once we ortho, connect the orthofix external fixator, we use the cautery cable to locate uh, the cora which we have uh, assessed preoperatively, and we do a open wedged uh, uh, osteotomy at the site of cora. Uh, the the size of the osteotomy could be adjusted with the orthofix till we get uh, the biomechanical axis corrected uh, with the cautery wire on table. Uh, so this is how we do, either with the cautery cable or with the uh, rod. So once we uh, achieved this, for this case, the preoperative uh, uh, cora was around uh, 12 degrees. So once we achieve the osteotomy, we just uh, uh, stop it. So, so even after uh, the osteotomy, the being the there is extra uh, orthofix in the tibia, it makes the stable fragment. We can go ahead with the proceed with the TKR. So, once uh, the osteotomy is done, then we go for routine distal tibia and distal femur cuts. And these are the uh, pictures taken while we are do, doing the tibial preparation. So once uh, this is this is the picture after uh, the tri trial processes of tibial tray with the stem. So once we do all the tibial and femoral cuts, we stabilize the osteotomy site with a unicortical uh, recon locking plate and screws. Uh, this is after inserting the trial processes uh, after completing uh, the bone cuts. So we, the, we take the cancerous bone from the uh, bone cuts for the tibial and bone cuts and we pack at the, the graft at the osteotomy site. So after packing the graft at the osteotomy site, we proceed with uh, cementing of the implant. Uh, this is uh, cementing of the final implant. So this is after completing uh, uh, cementing. Once uh, the procedure is done, the cementing is done, then we remove the uh, orthofix external fixator and we give a wash and we just uh, close the wound in layers. 
uh this is the post operative x ray after correcting the deformity uh, they have made post operative x ray and this is the post operative x ray of the left lower limb uh, after uh, two months uh, so post operatively we we follow up the patient with wound management and he will be put on tortoise weight bearing for the first three weeks uh, and gradually gradual and range of motion has tolerated uh, this is his post op follow up uh, x ray and uh, range of motion this is the pre op and post op uh, clinical photograph uh, this is the pre op video of the same patient rush Hmm? This is the post op video. You can see the appreciate the alignment of the limb. So we are running out of time. So Thank Dr. Rajkumar, final comment on this case. I want, want to oh. Yeah, yeah, please, Narayan. Yes, Narayan, please. Yeah. No, uh, it's a very nice, uh, beautiful demonstration of the technique in uh, difficult complex cases. but for the particular case you know i don't uh, you know feel that uh, all this uh, things are needed one thing and uh, usually my principle has been you know don't make the simple operation very complicated like this honestly okay. just to add one more small point uh, a patient with severe varus this kind of varus deformities when you bring it to little more valgus it becomes very difficult for the patient to uh, get a Uh, satisfactory mobility so in fact patient will not be so much happy maybe in this case okay but routinely i am telling uh, in fact now the concept is going for little bit of under correction rather than uh, valgus correction so valgusation is not an ideal one in these kind of situations so otherwise the technique wise yes it's a good uh, technique yeah. to have it as a uh, uh, arrow medium <clears throat> and uh, that's a very good very which good is time. used orthotics as a tool to correct the deformity extra articularly yes. very good very good yes, very thank good. you very thank you it's uh, innovative uh, excellent job then stop thank you. thank you so today's last speaker dr narayan who is from bangalore okay. can you see my slide yes yes it's going to be quick and uh, i'll not bore you long <laughs> so this is a 57 year old uh, lady uh, who had a knee arthroscopy and a meniscal balancing it is a surgeon's own word about 2 <laughs> years ago more you know more or less we all all have stopped uh, using arthroscopy for uh, osteoarthritis but this was done only important point to note is this patient never had a valgus deformity before the arthroscopy was done it was a medial meniscal tear in the mri and an osteoarthritis that's how she was walking with you know uh, before i saw that is about 2 years after the knee arthroscopy now these are the x rays of this lady you can see a standard valgus that is a standing stress view of the uh, right knee you can see quite open on the medial side and this is the mri scan of the knee uh, standing long x ray mri has been reported as severe osteoarthritis with a fluid intensity along the mcl and also a small cyst on the posterior medial aspect of the medial uh, collateral ligament distally and uh, is open for discussion yeah dr samir yeah one of the most uh, as per the history it can be a uh, because of the tight medial compartment to do a uh, posterior meniscus work he might have done tried some by crushing of the medial collateral ligament as a routine of many of the arthroscopy perfect so that my give a mcl give a and eventually the patient developed a progressive valgus deformity and that might be the reason why it is happening yeah it could be and uh, i would as you uh, we, because it's a valgus knee as a protocol you have done the spine line views in the long knees you can see and uh, this is on table examination on table you can see that so it's going about 45 degrees of uh, valgus and i have put an unconstrained trial on table just for examination you can see uh, how much the medial side is opening compared to the uh, the lateral side 
So I thought I'll do uh, some innovative thing. I uh, dissected out the medial meniscus. I thought uh, we'll see the meniscus. It was completely off distally. There was a cyst distally at the site of the pike thrusting. Hematoma was there as well. Now I have taken that uh, distal part of the meniscus like a, an, uh, an ACL uh, whip stitch. And I also harvested a semitendinosus, keeping the distal uh, uh, insertion intact. And then uh, used an interference screw, metal screws, both sides, normal screws, and uh, reconstructed that MCL using its original MCL plus the semi T, which I have taken in a standard manner, whatever the way I could do, you know, and tightened in around 30 degrees of flexion with a normal trial first. And that is the, uh, the picture of that uh, ligament which was reconstructed. And that is the post op x ray. You can see the two interpenal screws reasonably, the deformity has been corrected. There is a, this is not a, a normal standing x ray because this was done last week. So it looks like a little, uh, not a normal standard uh, x ray, what we see. And uh, by the time I finished that case, I saw another one. This is the an evidence of the root repair of the posterior medial uh, part of the medial meniscus, which obviously was a degenerate tear in this uh, patient. Seen an arthroscopist who had done a root repair. While doing a root repair, again, a pike resting was done on the medial side. And you can see what has happened. So probably this talk should have been on uh, an arthroscopy forum. But whoever, uh, I thought we'll all educate ourselves. Thank you. Naren, why did you put the stems? This was an unconstrained knee. No, it is unconstrained. You see, always, always, whenever you do an MCL repair, you know, the, however good you may be, you are not sure how good you can be, and you put a, some support with a constraint. Yeah, this is a constraint. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a constraint. Was, you can, you can see that constraint. Yeah. Was any stress views taken preoperatively? I mean, it was there. Here you go. Yeah, it was there. Uh, Narayan, only one thing, uh, uh, if you have uh, some part of the medial ligament, this repair will work Correct. beautifully. If you do not have anything, no substance on the medial side, and if you just do a semi tendinous, the failure rate is very high. Yeah. Pro this patient with a brace yeah. for a longer time, longer time. Actually, in fact, I have put a plaster on there. You yeah, don't yeah. believe it. Because no, that's okay. no, even after plaster is removed after even six weeks or so, yeah. so protect the knee in the some uh, ortholon type of brace yeah. so that you have a, something on the medial side which will hold on till you get a good fibrosis. Fibrosis. Yeah. yeah. So even even do. even with the constraint design, we have to do that. Semi yeah, even design. with constraint because the this is not a hinge. It is a, just Correct. a constraint. You cannot uh, rely on it. Not rely. So what's your, uh, Rajkumar, what's your experience in uh, uh, MCL reconstruction in, in TKR? MCL reconstruction? Reconstruction, yeah. It's a totally a different uh, story in this. Uh, the MCL reconstruction is uh, reconstruction for what is the most important thing, whether it is an acute injury or a chronic problem. If it is an acute injury, totally it is different. So all these repairs can be done end to end suturing and then augment it with all these grafts. But if it is a chronic condition, then the chances of, as Pachores are said, the chances of reconstruction will not work. The, uh, the options are very, very less. So you have to have a hinged as a backup. So there is no stem or any, uh, just a small semi-constraint will work for an NCL, MCL insufficiency. As simple as that. If it is acute, all this augmentation will work. If it is not acute, I don't think any augmentation will work. If it is an avulsion injury, MCL yeah. avulsion injury, then the results are good. You just need to fix it with screws the and just protect it with the brace and uh, it will all work out well and it will heal well. And you can see in this picture, the, the MCL which I have dissected out is quite good uh, because it was just the distal avulsion exactly where they have done the pie crusting. Hmm. Sir, pie crusting usually in the substance, sir, like uh, in artificial joint reconstruction... Uh, the joint reaction process, what they create, we usually depend upon only two collaterals. Very difficult to, I mean, I don't know how many, how many years follow-up we have, sir, now? No, this is just done recently. Now, okay. this is just an arthroscopy who has done a pie crusting, which has okay. given away the medial collateral ligament. Yeah. And, uh, yeah this is a good to, uh, we never seen this. Thank you. <laughs> I have seen two now, you see. Yeah, I've never seen that. Once it comes, it starts coming. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it's, I think it's very rare to see this. Uh, honestly, this uh, the posterior medial meniscal root repair has become quite popular. Maybe uh, it's definitely yeah. the reason. <laughs> but no. the success rate is not that good. Uh, like the root repair, uh, they come back with uh, failure very quickly. Uh, the meniscectomy works well, but yeah. not the root repair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, can, you, you can be telling that nicely in this forum. <laughs> no, no, I tell <laughs> even, it, even, <laughs> even to my arthroscopic surgeons, I keep telling them the same. Yeah. So, yes, Dr. Take home message. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dana yeah. and Rajkumar, yeah. yes. take home message. If there is a uh, MCL tear and it's a straightforward knee replacement. Uh, if it is acute, then you can go ahead and uh, take some grafts and repair it, Narayan. Otherwise, if it is a chronic one, then uh, you need to use... Uh, either way, you use a constraint. Semi-constraint should be okay. Uh, but if it is a, a very chronic MCL, then it doesn't... It, it, it will not heal. The, 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 yes, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. And particularly in a valgus, gross valgus, then there is it's a MCL general. insufficiency valgus. If you are not able to balance it, at the end of the day, it is better to use a hinge straight away where a patient will do well rather than having an unbalanced knee and without any constraint processes. So that, that should be, we should not use, uh, hesitate to use a hinge in these kind of situations. A valgus with a gross MCL insufficiency. Only, uh, you know, the real issue. Sorry, Narayan. If it is an acute one, uh, sorry, yeah. Narayan, if yeah. it is an acute one um, what does the literature say? Narayan, you, can you, you know, I think going in, going in for an unconstrained, what Narayan has done is really good because... Uh, no, it the, is a constraint. It is a constraint. Semi-constraint. No, no, it's it a semi-constraint. Semi Narayan, yeah, what yeah. you have done is semi-constraint, semi right? Yeah, yeah. I'll just... So the particles are lesser yeah. and the survival yeah. is better, isn't it? No, I, uh, Basaj, I understand your question. See, this uh, to, you know, the situation, what is real is uh, if you inadvertently damage the MCL during a trachea, you know, that is an acute injury, what, how will you come out? So the situation is whether you have a semi-constrained device on table or not. A lot of people, they don't have when they're doing these primaries. So in those situations, you know, you may have to repair it primarily like a whip stitch and other just, things. Which just has been to describe. sorry to interrupt, it is a mid-substance tear. Yes, mid-substance tear. That's where the saw, you know. Yeah. So you repair and augment if you can. The insufficiency is like the it's whole right. MCL is insufficient. It has become too lax. And it is very much in irreparable. So you cannot do anything. So that is a different uh, scenario. Correct. So and that situation what? can you can make out you know, in your pre-operative planning. That so is where the stress x-rays uh, play a very important role. It is important. Role. And you have that chronic insufficiency of MCL with a valgus. You must have the hinge. Otherwise, you should not start that case. Yeah. While what we are talking about is an acute injury interop. What Rajkumar has said is something that holds true. Over to Dr. Rajkumar. So, uh, yes, um, uh, I think I think we have come to the end of this uh, second webinar, and uh, it was very well conducted by Dr. Diraj and uh, it, uh, the panelists and everybody were point on, and the, there was a very good discussion, I think, and there were a lot of take home messages. I think everybody knows about all these uh, managements, but there were small, small, nice point outs points which were raised. And I think uh, valuable points from Dr. Pachore and Dr. Indrajit Sardar really helped us to gain some knowledge out of this meeting. I think the, overall it was a very good one. And uh, finishing remarks from, from Dr. Pachore and Dr. Indrajit Sardar. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Rajkumar, for asking me. To, but I think it was a good... Uh, uh, faculty and every, every case was discussed extremely well with a very very friendly ma manner and nobody should take it in the uh, <laughs> in other way uh, because uh, i pointed out uh, the foot drop so sorry about it but that's okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's okay uh, but i think it's an excellent uh, uh, whole uh, program was two hours we really learned quite a bit of things and uh, uh, especially the I never saw the orthoscopic uh, doing in a pie crusting and getting into the virus. <laughs> I think I also learned quite a lot of things from this uh, this one, and we should continue this academic activity, Rajkumar. And, sure, sir. Uh, sure, sir. Yes, and uh, yeah, yeah. And thank you all the presenters also, and thank you Dheeraj uh, for moderating, uh, and over to Indrajit, if he is there. He's there, he's there. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. I think it was a very great experience. Enjoyed every bit of it. 
and thank, thank you. Viraj and especially Rajkumar for thank stitching you. everything together. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks for the faculty for coming uh, and spending time here and also the presenters. They did a good job. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you. Uh, for thank all you, the support. Yes, and uh, thank you, Dr. Naveen and Dr. President also. Good night to everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.